uh, a macroporous, a macroporous uh, support layer, uh, but the active layer does all the work and block copolymers have uh, been used by this uh, technique called SNPs um, to make what's called non-isoporous uh, surfaces or membranes. Uh, Non-isoporous means it's not a single size, you know, there's a distribution, uh, but our goal was to think about, you know, working on these um, isoporous membranes, which is the true properties of block copolymers we want to exploit. And then there's the issue of, uh, you know, how easily can you make it? How can we test the characterize, characterize the membrane in terms of its structure? And that's where grazing incident, small angle X-ray scattering comes really useful. Uh, but it has to be coupled with other techniques as sort of the theme of the membrane. Uh, here you see some of the illustrations of, um, you know, the uh, the type of structures block copolymers can make lamellae, cylinders, gyroid, and primarily today I'll talk about cylinders and lamellae. So um, just a little bit about, you know, self-assembled polymeric membranes. In nature, they're actually ubiquitous. Uh, so you have all these membranes and in we are really behind in terms of synthetic chemistry, but block copolymer is trying to catch up there uh, in terms of trying to get this very diversity of shape, size, structure. So today I'll touch about a little bit about, you know, my first, um, most of it is about cylindrical pores. But if you look into nature, you find that there is a number of systems like uh, outer membranes and inner membranes that are non-cylindrical pores. So there is a real need to think about you know, the non-cylindrical pore and, and block copolymers have a potential solution there as well. Uh, finally, there is charge. And so I'll show at least one illustration of how, you know, um, separation of liquids uh, by way of uh, both shape, size, charge uh, is sort of the sort of the next generation of membranes that we need. So with that background, I just want to say that we do a lot of solvent casting and that you, in the end, you want it to be as simple as possible. Previous methods, you cast the block copolymer from a common salt, from a good solvent, like say toluene or something you can dissolve, say polystyrene, PMMA, or many other types of block copolymers. But the idea is, uh, you know, then you typically would need to think about treating the surface of the substrate or to put some shear on it to align it and so on. But can we just use what's called solvent evaporation annealing? This is SEA. And here you see you just pick a solvent that gives you the right orientation from get-go. Simplest, easiest, you can do roll-to-roll -roll processing. And, and there's been a lot of studies on SEA. And we wanted to think of a little bit more modification uh, to get, make it more versatile in terms of controlling pore dimension and et cetera. And we thought about, okay, can we do something uh, with ionic liquids. So the idea is that ionic liquids are uh, these um, uh, liquids, non-volatile liquid, and they can be, uh, actually Tim Lodge really popularized it, you know, from uh, Minnesota. Uh, I need a lot of work. Um, and then we found that the, uh, and Ned Thomas as well. Um, so these ionic liquids have uh, at least uh, selectivity in terms of what polymer they want to end up in. And they can be very fast. So they, the great news is that in the drying process, you get these block copolymer films, and in that short evaporation time, the ionic liquid can find its way because it's a liquid. It can readily find its way into say a, one of the blocks like PMMA. And so down below here, you can see in this picture no IL. You know you don't getting a, not getting a very good um, you know structure from the as cast film, but with IL uh, you can have very nice um, domain structures. And in fact, um, if you look at it, that's with AFM, you would think that the cylinder is going vertically down and that's where GI sacs comes in to verify, you know, how far down they go. Are they truly, you know, what's the size, uh, orientation, distribution, size, and so on. Um, so that's where the value of, you know, GI sacs have been coming in and we have been trying to uh, work on this problem. So a little bit more in detail. Uh, we are not the first to add ionic liquid for, controlling block copolymer orientation. Bennett actually at all did some early work in 2014. And he showed very nice several features which are really useful. So this first one on the A, which is 10K, 10K, it's a low molecular weight PSPMA. If you do the thermodynamics, you'll find that as shown here, 
it is a disordered block copolymer. It is below chi n has to be greater than 10.5. It falls below 10.5, so it's disordered without ionic liquid. But you add ionic liquid, and amazingly, it becomes highly ordered. And then that this is now a GSAC's uh, you know, uh, horizontal cut. And it shows you a nice Q star value with second and third order a little bit, just with 5% ionic liquid. And the reason is chi goes up because of the ionic liquid is a preferential good solvent for the PMMA block, all right? So that intra the, then the interaction with polystyrene goes up. So you can use ionic liquid to tune block copolymer interactions for sharpness of the interface is the main theme. And in fact, to bring order into disorder, which is a really nice thing. So why do we want small molecular weight block copolymer? Well, you know, if you want to have very high density of pores, the smaller the, the cylinder pore size, this would be one way to do it. But if you look at higher molecular weights, like 38K, 38K, you can see that the lamellar period, this is now lamelli. So Bennett did some really excellent work. And he showed that the lamellar period can be varied, uh, tuned from 40 to 50, which is significant. And the way he obtained that is, if you know, if you look at the uh, log, uh, you know, the, the intensity versus Q, with increasing IL concentration up to about 12%, this is now the right-hand corner, you can see that there's a very systematic shift with ionic liquid of the lamellar domain spacing. Um, but at some point, when you add too much ionic liquid down on the right-hand side, 17%, there is a, it actually transitions from lamellae to hexagonal. So it's, a, you know, it's a whole range of very interesting properties, starting from bringing order into disorder, you know, controlled uh, domain spacing, and then finally, trans a morphological transition. So we were really interested in this, and we started to, um, you know, add ionic liquid, as you can see by the AFM pictures, in the PSP MMA, uh, cylinder forming pores, you know, 100 nanometers shown here. And the uh, the inset just shows the you know FFT first Fourier transform, which is basically what GSACs would give you. Uh, so there is a very good way to now connect AFM structures with GSACs, and and this is we have to realize that AFM gives you the surface structure FFT, uh, which is in the Q space. The you know what GSACs would give you if it was only measuring the surface. So if you do the different angles GSACs, you will actually see when and if you do correlate with the AFM, uh, you know, FFT structure. So that's the beauty of the of this uh, approach. Um, so what we find here, as you can see, is that uh, in these cylinder forming block of polymer, all the way till 30, there is not much order, at least on the surface. And But then at 30, you get very nice order, and then 50 and so on, all the way to 100. So these ones, the cylindrical pores can accommodate a lot more ionic liquid uh, without changing morphology, which is very interesting. You know, the lamellae, you add more and it goes from lamellae to cylinder. And so there is something to be said about, you know, sort of um, the cohesive energy in a cylindrical format where it minimizes surface area, apparently keeps them, sustains them up to 100% ionic liquid by mass to the block of polymer. Uh, and it doesn't lose the circular, the shape gets distorted. There's a lot of pressure on the walls, but it doesn't maintain, you know, it, it maintains its shape. So then we can do very simple analysis, like average diameter of the cylinder, inter-cylinder diameter, and get power laws. And you can see them here. And the pore density, as you add more ionic liquid, of course, it goes down because the pores get bigger. And so for membranes, this is really important, the pore density and the pore size. And it's not, there is no real study of you know where is the flux optimum from a filtration because on one hand pore you know pore density is great but larger pore size would also give you higher flux so where is the you know that should have an optimum in that sense so um all right so i want to just show you uh com conclude with the afm pictures here that we can look at the top side we are able to, to you know float off the membranes look at the back side uh, on the left-hand side is for asymmetric membranes, very thin, 50 nanometer. On the right-hand side is symmetric membranes, which give very interesting square-like morphology under certain ionic liquid concentration. So adding ionic liquid is a very good tunable, um, you, know, um, you know, liquid to change the structure. And there's a lot of work we did. We published several papers actually with Joe and all, uh, showing that in, if you actually vacuum anneal them, at elevated temperature, you can even eliminate the ionic liquid. So you add the ionic liquid, get the structure you want, 
and then you can volatilize it and at high at low pressure at high high enough temperature which uh, was very surprising you wouldn't think that ionic liquid would evaporate but actually they do and even in half an hour of annealing they can get rid of them okay so now this is where gsax comes in you know do we really uh, in think that the afm structure perpetrates all the way to the substrate and this is where we do gsax at many different angles uh, but this is at, at a given angle for different weight concentrations of the ionic liquid and you can see here from A through H, all of these uh, um, GSACs, if you do the line cut, you will get very, just like Bennett did, you will get very interesting, um, you know, intensity profiles. And you will see that the, uh, you know, you would be able to um, obtain in some sense, the maximum vertical orientation of your system. So A, there's not much of the, of the side peaks, but you can see that it grows. And at C, it is probably you know, hitting its maximum. After D through you know, uh, G, it, is, it increases, it reaches a maximum. Then it actually has in E, you have some uh, repeti the, the um, undulation of the uh, QI peaks. Um, and so this is because we think, and this is where a lot more you know, uh, other methods are required, like neutron reflection, because we think that maybe there is some modulation of a couple of layers. So it can be a hybrid structure of one or two parallel layers along with perpendicular layers. So there is a, uh, still a lot of need for TEM and real space imaging, uh, but at a quick glance, uh, GSACs gives you great information. And by the time you get to H, you're not in the optimum vertical uh, orientation because the uh, peaks go down. So this is uh, you know just an illustration. We take all these snapshots that was a 50 nanometer film for a membrane. And uh, here's an example of a same uh, you know, scenario, but with a 100 nanometer thick film. And when you see these, as you go to you know, C through F and higher, in fact, H, you see the isotropic ring come up. That means that you have cylinders or lamellae, whatever it is, that are now meandering in the in-plane uh, domain uh, in the in plane uh, you know structure of the film which would in, would bring about tortuosity uh, to uh, to the you know to the membrane in fact you know um, you know we should think about as a community how to take these isotropic uh, scattering profiles and do uh, some average cuts to uh, maybe in a radial direction to figure out if we can actually get that tortuosity value. It's a mathematical definition, what is tortuosity for a membrane? And if we can actually pull out tortuosity and then confirm it with, uh, you know, um, some three-dimensional microscopy technique uh, like Hiroshi Jinai does, you know, with, uh, with TEM beautifully as a function of depth, uh, you know, which is really laborious, but it is amazing. And so if you can correlate tortuosity directly from GSACs, that's the kind of thing that's needed for the field in the future. Uh, but this just shows you that this has both a vertical component and an isotropic component. Uh, and we should, and then this needs to be studied as a function of a critical you know, angle. So normally you would do a couple of different angles. You do angles of incidence, grazing angle of incidence below the critical angle of the film, uh, which for us is about something like 0.12, uh, not shown here, but then you do add the critical angle and you do higher than the critical angle. So you probe, so the higher the critical angle, the deeper you probe into the film. So at the critical angle, you're just grazing sort of the surface. And you can see, you can get different information. So for this membrane structure, for example, at a critical, you know, at 0.14 degrees, you get, you see only one peak, okay? And that's because the higher order correlations are wiped out. It means, and you look at the AFM picture indeed, I mean, you can see that they are not very the, the, the in the cylinders themselves in terms of shape, size, orientation, all seem to be scattered over the place. But interestingly, if you go at point, go to 0.16 critical angle, then you find that you can see a significant second order peak and the first order peak did not change much from 0 0.022. So the average diameter inside is, is roughly what you see on the surface and you learn a lot because now you see a second order peak, which means that there are high order correlations. In fact, this tells you that inside the film, the uh, it is more homogeneous, uniform. And that's the reason you would think you would get a second order peak is because of the longer range correlation. 
uh, in plane of the structure. So we learned something right away that you know they actually you know it's it's better than it looks at the surface. Uh, so now what's the reason for that? It could be surface tension effects. It could be a, a number of things as the solvent evaporation is a very non-equilibrium process as well. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you know GSACs could tell you. And I think it's really useful, but it needs to be again corroborated with real space techniques. Here are some illustrations of GSACs on again asymmetric block copolymer with, uh, you know systems. Uh, in this case, the asymmetric, you know, we get uh, it did not really give us a very good you know vertical orientation for almost any concentration. So uh, this is a thirty five twelve you know molecular weight. Um, cast from tall wean with ionic liquid, and maybe, you know, you can argue that uh, somewhere between 10 and 30 percent is your best shot for getting the, uh, you know, the best vertical ordered membrane. But in general, this is not great. And, you know, there's also the film thickness issue with 100 nanometer. So number of problems we figured out, but we can really learn, uh, you know, from GSAC's um, conditions for that are critical for this very simple, add ionic liquid and you get vertical orientation. So here you can see that in fact, uh, this is now uh, a, a, a symmetric, lamellae forming symmetric block of polymer system. And you can see that B probably is the best. And indeed AFM shows you this fingerprint pattern. So uh, you add 10% ionic liquid, it is getting you the best results. And if you add too much, you are changing the structure to the point that it is no longer internally, vertical as it shows on the surface. So surface and internal structure are fairly well correlated, but you can't assume that from get-go. And you really need to do these measurements. By the way, the interesting thing, the reason is, you know, Bennett didn't actually answer the question, why adding ionic liquid makes the structures go perpendicular? In fact, that was not discussed at all. So we think the reason is, it's very interesting, ionic liquid doesn't like the silicon substrate. PMMA has a strong attraction by itself in its pure state to the silicon substrate and polystyrene dewets. But ionic liquids likes PMMA, so it doesn't like the substrate, and PMMA likes the substrate. So when it goes into PMMA, which is likes, it actually cuts down the interaction with the substrate enough to make it neutral with polystyrene. That is our working hypothesis, but we need to do a lot more. So we have a ternary system and these binary interactions act in a way so that the PMMA strong attraction to silicon is cut down by ionic liquid, which it imbibes, and thereby it makes it perpendicular because it matches the polystyrene silicon interaction. So, uh, but we need to work more on this, you know, with maybe for some theorists as well. Okay, so from here on, I'll just show you uh, sort of a splattering of um, other you know, interesting opportunities for membranes that opens up, uh, you know, with this uh, technique, but each of them would need a good study with GSACs, for example. And so I'll just, just go through these couple of examples. Um, here, we are making these membranes. Uh, there's a, it's a, you can see one through seven. Uh, we have a, you know, a, a, a polystyrene, sulfonated polystyrene layer that allows us to cast the block of polymer film, float it on water, Pick it up with the uh, macroporous substrate polyether sulfone on step four. Uh, and now we have this vertical order. But then we do the Tom Russell trick of you know, etching with UV and cross-linking and dipping it into acetic acid to remove the etched material. And lo and behold, we get the you know, porous mem nanoporous uh, block of polymer, which is really thin, 50 nanometer on a macroporous PES, could be a couple of microns. And that's your membrane, and then you test it out. Uh, but we do we do need other techniques is my point here. Uh, for example, how do we know we remove the ionic liquid? And so here we do time of flight sims, uh, and this is very useful. Um, and you can see that the chemical signal from ionic liquid drops from the black curve to the red curve as in the etched membrane compares to the you know unetched membrane. And so this is also seen in terms of the you know and if you do GSACs alone, you would see a big intensity increase because air polymer contrast is much higher than ionic liquid polymer contrast in the pores. However, you can't assume that it, it's the ionic liquid that went away. What about the, you know, could it be something else? So there's a clear chemical signature. So chemical methods, in fact, the future for GSACs would be in you know, some way to, to, to or like literally automatically couple chemical uh, uh, methods, you know, that you can obtain with um, so many, like, uh, you know, R socks and so on. 
resonance of text scattering and so on. Um, so uh, I'll just say that, you know, we have all the setup to uh, study filtration on the right hand side, you know, that's the UV etching chamber, filtration tests, we measure the filtration, you know, the water flux as a function of time. And uh, so we have all the setup now. And then, uh, as I said, chemical uh, interrogation is important for membranes. So for example, we have a dye labeled dextran. Dextran is this large carbohydrate molecule. And we can study what comes out of the membrane of the filter membrane. Uh, and you can see that the, for example, the red one is a lower intensity. So that means the dextran was rejected by the membrane compared to the, you know, uh, the blue one. So that is just an illustration of the kind of things we do. Um, but, you know, we were really interested in developing some real membranes. So actually we partnered with Qatar University and with ConocoPhillips, and we uh, did a whole bunch of studies uh, for oil water separation. And just showing you that, um, uh, you know, this thing about optimization of pore density with pore size, uh, is not uh, trivial. So if you look at just the red dots, uh, as the ionic liquid content increases, it goes through a maxima and then comes down, right? This is in terms of the flux. So the flux goes through a maximum and comes down. Uh, and you can have different UV conditions, but that uh, this kind of a, you know, uh, nonlinear uh, profile doesn't change, non-monotonic, I should say. So there is then the one has to figure out the reason for this, uh, you know, maximum, but it is clearly in my mind, it is the pore density times the pore size. And, and if you, you can have large pores, but uh, for sure, um, you're decreasing pore density, right? So where's the optimum? Uh, so that's one, that there's a non-monotonic behavior. And then if you look at rejection, again, if you think about it, uh, and these are the pores of different size and all that created with different UV conditions and ionic liquid. Uh, the black curve is at the top compared to the blue, and this is rejection. So you have to think about, you know, is rejection most important to you or is it the flux? And this is sort of goes back to the, you know, age old uh, prediction that, uh, you know, the Robinson's law, which is, you know, flux and uh, rejection are uh, inversely coupled. You can have high flux, low rejection, and then vice versa. So then the next big challenge is how to get high rejection and high flux. But again, I think blockopolymers actually offer the solution. And here's the reason why I think so. If you look at all the traditional membranes, reference membranes down there, around 200 is the average, you know. But if you look at the high molecular weight with ionic liquid on the circle with the green circle on the, on the blue uh, dot, you can see that the ionic liquid highly ordered BCP membrane can, can show really high, um, you know, flux, for instance. What about the rejection? Well, that is yet to be tested, but we started, we worked with, as I said, ConocoPhillips was published, and we actually ran several real uh, liquids, you know, like, uh, you know, dirty water, what, whatever comes out, it's called processed water, PW, crude oil in all its different forms, then they run it through some chemical cleaning treatment and retest it three times, okay? so. Our blockopolymer membranes actually stood through this whole process really well. And you can see that we had 74 to 79% rejection rate of TOC. TOC is total organic content. So it worked really well, very, in fact, very close to commercial membrane. So they were very excited, you know, and, and, and this is of course, you know, work with uh, Qatar. So um, university, um, so they have real potential. Uh, I'll just spend one or two minutes uh, because I think my time is almost getting up. Um, that, you know, we can separate ionic, ionic liquids. So for lithium ion batteries from brine, which is sodium chloride, there's a 4% lithium chloride, carbonate and so on dissolved in brine. And how do you separate it? Well, now you don't extract the ionic liquid. You actually have the brine solution go through the ionic liquid in the block of polymer membrane. And you can see we're getting 40 sodium chloride rejection compared to lithium chloride. In fact, now we have hit more like 70. This is an old slide. So this is very exciting because uh, if you look at the literature, the rejection is, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, papers showing more greater than 25% rejection. So uh, separation of, you know, all the lithium that you need for electric cars and batteries and so on uh, is going to be really important in the future. I want to kind of stop here, but I want to say that there is a whole range of other um, 
you know, separations. Uh, sorry, I'm skipping through in the interest of time. Uh, so nanoparticle rejection, um, we do a lot and we're able to show us that size, that circular particle versus rod-like particle can be separated in lamellar block copolymers because the rods can align with the slit and go through. And we have GSACs as well to, you know, sort of confirm these as they go through. But what we really like to do is have in situ operation of these membrane and do GSACs, you know, as it's separating. So then we'd be sensitive to, you know, what is going through the location and so on. So that's sort of the next uh, horizon of, you know, GSACs. But you can see here that the separation is very good between a spherical nanoparticle, the same hydrodynamic radius as the, you know, as, as, as a rod with, uh, you know, 40 nanometer length by 10. There's a big difference uh, between what goes through. The rods go through, the spheres don't. Same with anisotropic proteins. There is uh, the rod-like proteins, the lysosome BSA go through. IgG doesn't because it's a globular protein, which is spherical, and it has, you know, it is rejected. So I think the future, and this is, uh, you know, just showing you quantifying that. So I'll, I'll end here. I think that the ability to, um, you know, sort of mod modulate block copolymer membranes with ionic liquid is a big open field now. And the fact that we can, you know, um, use the ionic liquid for ionic separation or remove it and then do, you know, size and chemistry-based separation, uh, chemistry hopefully for the future. But what's the advantage? You know, you get high domain size, uh, sorry, you get domain control. You don't have to create a new block copolymer of different molecular weight for every uh, filtration, you know, requirement. You get very high flux, as I showed, you know, I showed you on the chart that ours was substantially higher. There is a trade-off between rejection and flux, and that is controllable. Uh, and finally, there's, uh, you know, I would say GSACs is critical to get the first glimpse, uh, but we want to do it in operando, as the word goes these days, right? We want to actually have membranes on the GSACs beamline and, and do it in real time, uh, sort of in a sort of a dynamic fashion. Um, so, okay, I am happy to answer any questions you have. Sorry for the little delay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Karim. Very nice talk. Um, I think we can take maybe one or two short questions. Uh, Eva, please. Um, thank you for this very interesting talk. Can you um, suggest that why the ionic liquid is actually be, um, making these um, patterns so much more pronounced? So is it because of their charge they have, or what is the reason for them to behave that yeah, way? Good, good question. Um, I think that ionic liquids have very high cohesive, uh, cohesive energy density. I mean, you think about mercury, right? It likes to form droplet, right? So I think the ionic liquid has very high cohesive energy density because of the charged species. And so if it likes a particular polymer, it goes into it and it tries to conform the shape to its uh, to minimize the contact area, which is a sphere. So it, it, it basically is, it, is it's, uh, it goes into the PMMA, for example, it doesn't like polystyrene and it's trying to make a spherical domain. But if you add more and more ionic liquid, how, where does it go? Well, it tries to sort of sequester it inside that domain. And so in the future, if we had really, you know, 50 nanometer kind of, uh, you know, X-ray uh, beams, if we could actually go through these rods, because at some point the brush, like, so that's my idea, that's the idea. Up to some point, it will remain, the brushes will remain a corona, you know, with touching each other. But if you add too much ionic liquid, I think it's going to form pure ionic liquid core with swollen PMMA brush around it, right? So that's the idea. But at the heart of it is high cohesive energy density and strong attraction to one of the blocks. Okay, selective attraction is very important. Thank you. So hope that answers, yeah, okay. All right, I think we should let the, um, you know. Uh, Sunny has a question, right? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> hi, uh, uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk, Alamgir. That was beautiful. Um, I have a quick question about your disordered uh, uh, in the plane uh, uh, GSACs data. You showed uh, uh -huh. some uh, circular kind of uh, 
diffuse patterns in the in the two dimensional GSAX plot. That was yeah. a that was a plot of uh, uh, in in QZ QX space, I presume, right? Yeah, oh, sure. QZQY space, right? QZQY, QZQY. Yeah. So, um, if if uh, did you check was was did they did those curves correspond to QX squared plus QY squared equals a constant? Because it should have been quite anisotropic uh, if it was just in plane random ordering, right? Very uh, good. Was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Sunny, that's a great question. I would say. We didn't in the past. I've done it for some other systems, uh, like you know, um, uh, when we were working with you know uh, the um, all the solar cell materials, uh, P three HT and so on. Uh, I would expect shear to be required to break the in plane symmetry, and so the next step is actually and 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 furthermore, the slit, uh, the lamellar slit membrane, have a chance of showing that and when i say that i mean that if you get large grain size even without any shear within a grain they could have a one direction right so i think as we get to smaller spot size and look at individual grains of particularly lamellae forming you could see it as far as cylinder goes if you can have uh, you know at least um, three orders uh, i would say i would say you know i would say three correlation lengths going out of this hexagonal symmetry, we would see it as a hexagonal symmetric structure and check that. It's a great suggestion. Uh, we wanna do that. And we have some ideas how to shear it just by spin coating at high speed so that the radial shear will align during the ionic liquid casting process. So this is a, uh, so then it's not anything, you know, don't do anything special. So Sunny um, would be happy to, do that in the future. That's actually the really good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, I just asked because we see very similar GSAX patterns in uh, um, in multilayer um, uh, uh, membranes that we've been looking at uh -huh. also, and we are trying to figure out what 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 they're telling us. And thank are you. these multilayer are block copolymers or other materials? No, no, they're just uh, they're just. Uh, um, you know, uh, ordinary uh, biological membranes. Got it, got it, got it. I think we should take that analysis and apply it first to the cylinder, the lamellae. Yeah. Um, because we know the fingerprint pattern really well. And maybe we can even do a calculation of, uh, you know, whether that would apply to a um, whole set of grains that are randomly oriented. Um, and at what, what, right. uh, GSAX focused, you know, spot size, we would actually see the individual grain. So this is a big challenge for GSAX people. Can we get at grazing angle, look at individual grains, which is a couple of microns. Right. Can we get, can we get a, you know, a footprint of a couple of microns? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sure. Thank you, Professor Thank you. Karim. So if we have Thanks. more uh, uh, discussion, uh, we can leave it to the end of this morning yes. uh, session. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, sure. Um, our next speaker is Professor Ting Xu. Ting, can you uh, try to uh, uh, share your screen? Um, I can't to... Um, oh, oh, can oh you, can yeah. You, Kareem, yeah. You? Can you share? Did, did you oh, allow me to share? share? Okay, stop share. Yeah. Got it, Ting. All right. Hi. Good to see right. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's see if I'm... Hi, Ting. Hi. How are you? Hold on. <laughs> let me... See where is my file? Here we go. Okay, I I I will introduce Ting. So Ting Xu is a professor of uh, uh, chemistry and material science and engineering at the University of California Berkeley. She got her PhD at University of Massachusetts Amherst. She did her postdoc jointly at UPenn and NIST before joining the faculty at Berkeley. So uh, among her many awards and honors. Ting is a fellow of uh, American Physical Society and, uh, and also American Chemical Society. So her research focuses on rational design of polymer-based hybrid materials for life science, environment, and energy applications. So her title of the talk is, uh, is uh, uh, Towards Functional Nanocomposites Kinetic Pathway Rules. Go ahead, Ting. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. 
um, it's, it's great to see so many friends and um, yeah, getting people together. Look forward to see this new beam line um, um, development. So anyway, uh, let me tell you a little bit of where we are uh, currently most excited about it. and the work I'm going to talk about um, are really done by this two brilliant lady, Lama and Emma Margo. And of course, we have just tremendous help from everyone in the session as well as uh, people outside. Um, so let me just get this. Oh, the, the project's been funded by DOE um, since I first started. So let me start to um, challenge the nanoscience community. We've been talking about nanostructures for quite a bit, and we are really good at making nanostructures and their ideal conditions. So we can have this very beautiful um, um, chemistry structure, and then in the end, the assembly we get. And I think for polymeric materials, as we discussed uh, by you know, just now, uh, you know, we really start to think about it. We have to think about the processing. But I wanted to add additional dimension. That is, uh, we have to design nanomaterials at the system level. That means that uh, besides what we see in the phase diagram, we have to think about uh, how this nanomaterial should be integrated when you wanted to uh, integrate them into a device. And uh, let me just use one example, multi-layered film technology are everywhere. You probably hear them in the news because they certainly create a lot of uh, uh, trash issues. Well, on the other end, people want us to improve it for packaging, um, you know, um, as a barrier material, for example. So in this case, what do you see is that besides individual layer composition, layer thickness, that's, you know, we have been done so much, as well as a uh, microscopic alignment. We also really have to think about the interface, how we're going to do adapt, get generated system that is adaptable. So it doesn't matter what the device you are uh, interested in, whether it's a photovoltaic battery or it's a food packaging, uh, or you wanted to think about it as uh, you know window for optical um, light manipulation. And you also, uh, I would like to, um, discuss something about, you know, can we really engineer defects? You know, um, we have been doing that very well in direct self-assembly, but when you start to integrate the materials over microscopic level, um, how we can to manipulate not just the density, but also uh, the defect of variety. And of course, processing, um, you know, when you have nanomaterials, you just don't have hours and days to integrate it. You really have to be compatible with the rest of it. And among all of this, I do think uh, self-assembled community has great advantage when we start to um, include life cycle um, as a, a good, um, as a, a very important merit of figure going forward. Going forward, anything we design, we have to have life cycle analysis, have to think about how, where we're going to source material and where it's going to go. So this really get back to think about is the chemistry uh, the component you have in there. So many times when we think about chemistry, we think thermodynamics was my face diagram it's going to be. And when you talk about processing, you start to get into lens skill. This is not just talk about the structure, but also start to think about how you're going to um, control the structure across this atomic to microscopic, this structure hierarchy. And that is not um, an easy trick when you start to um, do everything at once. And of course, when you start to think about the life cycle, you have to not only just what you can make, but also can you really generate the materials with a programmable disassembly? So that's not something that I would be able to address here, but anyway. Um, so let's start to rethink about nanomaterial design. And this is how um, personally I see uh, what we should think about. In the past, we have building blocks with general nanostructure. We're done. You know, it's very rare they would start to across multi-lens skills. But going forward, what we really need to think about is uh, to have building blocks, you know, many, many of them, and then to be able to assemble materials that beyond what you see under the you know electron microscope, as well as uh, even beyond the skills the skill that you can access using your scattering. So when you have all these building blocks, start to put them all together. 
oftentimes used in secondary interaction. You can really treat it as a multi-step reaction. So that means that each of your building block as well as the building assembly made from them can act as a reactant. So that means during the intermediate state, you will have this highly variable undefined reaction mixture, which you don't know what are all the reactants are as well as their concentration. Subsequently, what that means is that the interaction between the building block as well as the diffusion among the, each of them is going to vary, but yet you know what do you want. You want to start with a building block, have this well-defined structure to arrange it across many land skills at the level you want it. And that itself is not a trivial. And if you want to add this reversibility, that means each of them is going to be an equilibrium. That means that external direction will matter. So kinetic, this is also start to think about the pathways, right? So when we do a film casting, for example, we're also thinking about this form nanostructures, we arrange nanostructures and the microstructures subsequently arrange getting to a microscopic level. And again, if you follow the same thoughts as a multi-step reaction, you're going to have issues with diffusivity. That means the building blocks will vary in size and shape. You're going from a molecular to a microscopic, you can imagine their diffusion is going to be different and their diffusion mode is also going to be different. You want a structure, the structure at create interface and the interfacial diffusion is completely different ballpark, especially when you start to look into this repulsive interaction during the assembly. So this is where we start to think about that we wanted to, so all the things I discuss is basically saying that there are tremendous amount of uncertainty in the system. And we have been so much used to from precision, well-defined system, get to where we want. And we are not really good in dealing with variations, uncertainties, and uh, as well as heterogeneity. So what we, in, the we, in the past few years, what we've been looking at is really start to taking advantage of entropy. And let me just start with what our you know, hard material colleague has been studying is high entropy alloys. It's actually pretty simple. If you look into this equation, it's basically a copy paste from floor hydrogen theory, um, one of them I use. So basically we're saying that as you start to increase the composition, the variety of the building blocks, your mixing entropy contribution to the free energy is going to increase substantially, especially as you find A getting really small. So, each individual component is going to have its entropic. By the time you go beyond one, two, beyond three, four, um, actually it's for the high entropy alloy, by the time you go beyond five, a lot of new interesting phenomena come in. And they do have this formulation flexibility. This is really amazing of this entropy driven phase behavior. And we have been thinking about if there is a way to really take advantage of this entropic contribution. And we deal with entropy all the time. You have that associated with polymer chain conformation. But we want to think about it if it is possible to introduce the concept into this structured system. That means you form, have some building blocks in the system, and it's going to form this type of structure. And imagine if I have a dye block of polymers that's made of the A and B component. And then you can imagine form alpha and beta phase. It's A rich and B rich phase. You start adding third, fourth uh, component or even fifth component. If you keep the solubility for the additional CDE component in between A and B, the C is going to disperse. And we know that that's you know, a lot of compatibilizers used for polymer blends. And in that case, what you see is the alpha and beta phase miscibility start to increase. And by the time you add into like a four or five or six component, you begin to have a multiple um, formulations that will give you the same effective interaction between alpha and the beta phase. And at some point, the interaction between the alpha and beta phase can be completely equal to zero. So that means the system is miscible, but yet the system, it will give you the structure. And the, look at the alpha and the beta phase, you also begin to have a formulation flexibility. So what do you see is that as you increase the system complexity, diversify the chemical building blocks, as long as you follow certain rules, you are 
there are possibilities to really get into this high entropy alloy type of version in the soft matter. We actually didn't design it. We accidentally ran into this. Um, so the question is that how are you going to choose all the solubility parameters of each component? And there are additional questions associated. How can you set up alpha and the beta phase to the beginning? So we've been dealing with the supermolecular nanocomposite for more than 10 years. So basically what we get here is that it's polystyrene, polyphorol, and the building with a small molecule called the PDT that PDP, the hydrogen bonded to the form of the purity group. But nevertheless, what this is really seeing is that you can have block polymer based supermolecules set up the alpha and the beta phase. And then when you start to increase the amount of the small molecules, this is where you basically put in the third, fourth, and fifth component in there. This is all the small molecule we have in there. So the small molecule solubility parameter is selected to be between the polystyrene and poly for purity um, and PDP block. Then, of course, we we'll start to continue to diversify the nanoparticle. We'll have all the different small molecules in there. The system was not designed, even look back, we just say, you know, it's really good luck. But back then, the design was very simple. It's okay, small molecule media, the particle interaction, and you have a chain architecture. So, you know, like, you know, almost 15 years ago, we show you we can get in assemble. And then over the last you know, 10 years, we'll just keep saying the system is really diverse. We actually never realized why it has been so versatile. Literally, we can do anything. I think we fully understand that. So with that, we actually can really begin to pursue forward because if the system is admissible, you no longer have this templated assembly of nanoparticle. You can begin to start think about co-assembly because in essence, you're dealing with this multi-component blends and you can basically back calculate what are the entropic, entropic contribution from each system. And indeed, based on the data, what you show here is that we can start to expand the particle size and without um, disrupted assembly and the co-assembly indeed lead to new morphologies we haven't seen before. So for example, this one is, uh, uh, it's a lamellae, but looks like a profile lamellae. But if you see the nanoparticles, the nanoparticles are reside in puncture at one of the lamellae in there. And if you look at the interface of the particle between the organic matrix, it interacts with both components. It really suggested that the system doesn't really pay penalty for this interface between the two component that give you the microdomain as well as the particle with either of them. And even though this is a new morphology, if you look into, so we did a, a, a stem tomography and then we look at the histogram of the unit cell, you can see that the unit cell is very uniform. And then, you know, if we can get into a situation with high entropy, alloy version of the soft matter, we should have a, a flexibility in the formulation. This is exactly the case. We can change the particle size, as I mentioned before. We can change the block of polymer composition. We can change the small molecule amount. We can change the particle core chemistry. We can also change the small molecule type. So all those really open up a lot of opportunities for you to start to think about this system design because all the variabilities I mentioned to you during the nanomaterial growth is no longer a problem because the system has this adaptability to vary what it needs to be. So in fact, this was quite useful. Um, Emma was the one that uh, really pushed this forward. So you probably have heard that people are interested in generating concentric ring, concentric ring nanoparticles. And then you know, if you do, um, um, you know, zone plate is one of them. People are trying to get into this small pitch and there has been a lot of work, you know, Karen Ross, for example, they use block of polymer, try block of polymers, look at the incommensibility getting to the ring. And the, you know, Emma did this a very simple uh, analysis, basically look at the, the strengths for bending this, uh, you know, cylinders or lamellis, and then how you're going to deal with this interface mismatch between the inner of the ring and the outer of the ring. And as well as you change the, a distance away from the center, you also change this curvature. So this is where the adaptability of the system come in to be very handy. Imagine if the system is able to regulate which each individual component is to fill the gap or take the material away, you're going to release that elastic constraint that from the bending 
of the microdomain. And this is in fact is the case. And we can, you know, just take things out of the shelf without much thought, we just get in there. We can generate range concentric with all the different uh, pitches and different width. And um, you know, the, the, the degree of order is quite good. And if you can put nanoparticle in there, in this case, you basically have this circular uh, or organized plasmonic uh, coupling in between the particles. And this give you new interesting optical properties. And <clears throat> we collaborated with our um, colleague, Jie Yao, and they did optical measurement. And this is out of my uh, range, but uh, uh, basically told me that you can get a really high quality orbital annual momentum that can be used as imaging as well as calculation if you want to. So what you see here is a very simple because we got this algorithm patent and each square, what you see here is 10 by 10 rings and within the rings, they are concentric rings. And uh, you know, because you do directly self-assembly, um, can put it on the lithography pattern, the substrate, and they can use scotch tape and peel it off the pattern, put it on top, right on top of the, the optical tip. And then based on the last figure, you see all those black, um, like a donut ring that really shows a high quality OAM. So now I'm going to go um, start to talk about kinetics. So basically saying that with the entropic driven assembly in multi-component blend, we believe we solve the issues associated with some of the dynamic driving force for the assembly. And then the question is how are you going to control the system in order to get what you want? So this is a case we wanted to use a film casting as example. As the solvent evaporates, it's, you have a driving force to form the assembly, whether it's enthalpic or entropic driving force. But yet when the nanostructure form, the system ability will be lower. But when you're trying to organize the structures through the hierarchical tiers, you need more mobility to move larger structure instead of smaller structures. So this led us to redesign the system, think about perhaps we can flip it. We can really deal with large structure organization while the solvent concentration is high. So instead of making the nanostructure first and getting to the microstructure, we say, how about we make microstructure first and then subsequently we grow nanostructure. And this is exactly the idea. And then we just have to identify where uh, the system is is at what concentration the system is going to form what. So in dilute solution is um, uh, quite important to map out where individual component is. And this is again, you know, the entropic driven phase behavior is a very, is highly valuable because if you have this repulsive entropic driven assembly, you're going to have a trouble to even get the nanostructure assembly or to even get the molecule together because the solvent completely shield off repulsive interaction. But nevertheless, with the system we have here, so the figure A is uh, a five and 10% small neutron scattering in deuterated uh, Tolerating a deuterated chloroform with present of nanoparticle. The signal is weak, but because we are really rely on the contrast match of various systems to tell us what things are. So when we feed the data, basically what we see is that at a five a five volume percent, everything is in, you know, have a little bit of molecular aggregate, but overall the system, the particle is randomly distributed. There's no particular um, arrangement and it's not suitable to form this molecular aggregate that we can arrange at a microscopic level. But when you get into 10%, this is where the particle begin to aggregate and begin to select it, um, get into one um, rich domain instead of the other. And you begin to have this uh, concentration fluctuation uh, around your, uh, inside of your aggregates. And then we also did the ultra small actually neutron scattering, neutron scattering um, to basically look at when you form those aggregates, which has this you know certain sort of correlation in there with nanoparticles selectively distributed within one rich domain, uh, it get into in the range of a, a few microns. So that is useful. It's basically saying that we can. Even though the nanostructure has a form, but we are able to arrange the, the polymer chain to generate this concentration fluctuation within the system, and they are in the microscopic level. We just have to organize them. 
And then this is where we're getting into how you're going to organize um, the system because you do need to have the driving force, even if it's a colloidal particle assembler, you need to have the concentration to provide that entropic driving force for them to arrange. This is where we're getting to XPCS. So, so we did in situ XPC as to look into the diffusion a mode of the particle and use that to, to infer what is the surrounding organic matrix organization, as well as uh, to see the system diffusivity or mobility across the different lens skills. So the left is the smog actually scattering profile um, that give us to identify the window that we should do analysis of XPCS. And what do you see is that we separate out them into a separate one, two, three, four, five different regime. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to number two and then number three. Okay, most of us are interested in number five, to us that is too late. In number four, it's already too late. So when you're looking to the system assembly, look at the pathways, you really have to go before any nanostructure form. And then in this case, basically what you see is that in the early stage, the system had the subdiffusive, and this is really consistent from what we show in the small and the neutron scattering, that is the particle is trapped within this polystyrene coil mesh. And then as you go to start to see a correlation in the system, that means the chain start to connect to form this concentration fluctuation um, with a certain periodicity in the system, you change it from a subdiffusive to a diffusive. That's where basically the particle get released from the polystyrene match become to concentrate in this P4 EP, PDP rich regime. And then after that, subsequent the system is just going to order. And we wanted to look at the mobility. This is where how um, we decide to look at the relaxation time as a function of Q. The idea is that if you have a short range diffusion, that means you have a higher Q that's nanoscopic. And we also look at the, the tau L that we look at in the larger scale. We wanted to see nanoscopic arrangement versus microscopic because we're dealing with nanostructure and the microstructure together. We wanna see when the system begin to couple versus uh, when it's completely separate. As expected, you know, if you're looking to uh, before um, the stage two, uh, that's where you begin to see this correlation hole in there. And the system has a really high mobility. That means this is consistent because your nanostructure has a really formed. What is interesting is after the nanostructure form, we see this direct correlation, direct ratio between the tau S and tau L is about 10. And that's exactly corresponding to the Q they are looking at. It's basically saying that once the structure form, the the micro and the nanoscopic diffusion are completely coupled. But what is also interesting, what you see is that even though after the nanostructure form, you see the relaxation time begin to get lower. So this is a surprising because the solvent is continuously being evaporated, but the system appears to have a higher mobility. And this is where we believe that this interlayer um, sliding motion is becoming important. We have some data look at this and isotropic, but we just have to analyze it. But nevertheless, from all this data, really help us to program how we should process this material. So I'm going to show you a few things. The processing is so simple. We cast it and then we dry it. And the only thing, the parameter we have to deal with at what concentration we start to drive quickly and how long will you stay at a certain concentration. So if I can take your uh, eyes to it, you can see that at 23%, obviously the microstructure is now forming. The, we get nanostructures, even though this is rapid solvent removal, indicating that nanostructure formation is really governed by short range diffusion. It's very quick. So you shouldn't spend your time to generate nanostructures. But instead, when you look into the solvent, the second line, you see that the nano sheets form a really high aspect ratio. And this is 28% uh, is before the nanostructure form is about 30%. Very you know, close, but you know, a couple of percent solvent difference but that is sufficient to be able to generate the microstructures. And you can see the nanostructure forming. When you start getting about 40%, that's 30% is where nanostructures kick in. Then you have this two competing process. The one is one form nanostructure, and the yet you also want to have this large aggregates to form together getting to the microstructure. So in this case, we're basically saying that, you know, you 
dry it too long, actually it help it compromise your long range order. So if you're going to look at how long this process um, can, uh, how successful this process, I want to show you the color here, each color coded as one nano sheets. And if you look into the color coding there, if it is getting to the red yellow range, you are talking about tens of microns in terms of the sheet length. And that is really high because that gives you the aspect ratio of the sheets is over hundreds of you know, in the hundreds, sometimes even to the thousands range. And in terms of a anisotropic 1D material growth, that is a substantial. And this is again show that if you control the assembly pathway and to really match the system ability with the structure, target structure you wanted to grow, it's going to be a very effective. So with this, and the, you know, I'm just going to pass this because the time, um, because you understand the pathway, you are in the situation to be able to control the defect type because the growth process and as well as the local chain reorganization at the defect site is going to affect what the defect type you have. And then that is quite important for the application, even though it hasn't been really investigated for um, nanomaterials beside direct self-assembly. So once you have these numbers, you just have to put it into application. And then this is, uh, we are interested in making a, a multi-layered films as a barrier materials. And then what I show you on the top, that is about 220 um, sheets across is over about a 90 microns. And the, the green dots there are corresponding to defects. So those defects are end to end. The two yellow ones are the only two we saw. First of all, among the whole area, we have a very limited, it's only a little bit over 140 uh, defects that give us a defect density at 0.0, uh, less than 0 0.056. And then if you look into the ash plot of defects plotted, so we are quite low. And then the other thing is that out of all the defects in there, um, over 97% are end to end and where the defects is fueled by the nanoparticle. That's quite important. So, um, you know, of course you get it, you get to try it, see what's the property is going to go. And uh, you know, without further ado, I just want to tell you that uh, we basically look at the gas barrier properties because it's quite important when you start getting into the packaging um, or even get into the interior design, for example. And, uh, you know, it's not surprising, basically saying that, you know, poor order, no nanoparticle or small molecular weight polymers or block of polymers are all performed poorly. But when you have this right length scale for your feature size, right control over defect density, as well as microscopic alignment, you get a really good performance. So um, I just wanted to um, end there and then leave uh, you some of the thoughts here. I think thermodynamically, we really shall explore this entropic driven phase behavior instead of this very tight, precise chi driven assembly um, in order to gain this adaptability at the system level. And I do think kinetics is uh, something that we can control quite a bit by the end of the day. It doesn't matter how good your design is, you have to do, uh, you have to have a good execution. And that's where the kinetics of the any nanomaterial growth is important. And I do think XPCS um, is very important. We're so grateful that Qingteng really get us uh, uh, in there to, and Qingteng and Suresh, they are willing to work with us in the beginning. We know nothing about it, but it turned out to be probably one of the most exciting uh, technique I, I am right now. So uh, with that, I should be, uh, I'm done and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Professor Xu. Yeah, let's take a few short questions. Um, great talk. I have a quick question. Um, you know, the uh, in one of the uh, SACs, the whole setup, you know, step one, stage one, stage through, stage four. It's interesting. The first peak went from in stage three, the first peak is Gaussian looking. Yep. Stage five is Gaussian looking, but stage four looks like as though it's two Gaussians, you know, yep. one broader, one sharp. 
Yeah. Do you have an explanation? Like maybe it's different, measuring different um, scales no. within your system? No, no. So what we think is the hump is the correlation, is aggregates. The peak is the ordered structure. So this is exactly okay. what we expected. We're basically saying that the nanostructure formation is, cons it's, it's, you template everything, they are in the short range, and when it's time to go, it show up immediately. If you if I play the screen for you, you're going to see that the spots doesn't gradually show up. They just show up almost like at ah, the click. Okay. So this Excellent. is also consistent. If you see the TM pictures, when I do a quick solvent removal, trying to trap the system, you see, what are you talking about? You don't have aggregates, you have nanostructures. So what we have seen is that nanostructure formation can be really fast and it's not a kinetic rate limiting factor. Fantastic, okay, thank Thanks. you. Thanks, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, all these, uh, uh, hi, uh, hi Tina, uh, uh, very nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, can I, I'll get my uh, video on. So I, I just have a, a question about the, the uh, uh, you know, very interesting uh, 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 talk. Uh, uh, so so those uh, ring structures are very interesting. You yeah. know, this is something, you know, we don't normally see, you know, in yeah. the block copolymers. So that the so, uh, first question is that the, you know, uh, how are, you know, the, uh, so, so the uh, the formation of that is through a nucleus uh, uh, on the surface, or or something else. And also, can you control uh, the uh, the thickness? Uh, uh, you know, so so you you had had an application of uh, uh, for zone plate, uh, but uh, well, so so that the, so then you you need to get the, a good a control of the uh, uh, the width of those uh, uh, rings, right, so. Yes, so it's on a lithography pattern surface. So those are pictures we have in there. So within that, if you look into the three pictures there, I can use the supermolecular nano, a supermolecular framework to control the width. And this is, we have like maybe like five nanometer nanoparticles. Okay. So if it's the rings within that is a super molecule matrix, and then that within that there is nanoparticle. Okay. The so the only thing, go ahead. Uh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. The only thing, the trick for this fabrication is that we need to have a little bit. So the film has to be casted, have just a little bit above the trench so that in between the ring, the system can have a pathway to get the small molecule to transport from one place to the next place because this is actually I didn't get time to talk about it what do you see the right ring here the system self-regulate where the small molecule goes in order for them to form ring do you see what i'm saying so if you see yeah. the, beside the ring but the outside you see this rim is almost like uh, something is spilled over so they locally adjust it Okay. And what do we do is very simple. It take about two minutes to make this. We spin cast, we knew that's it. Okay, this is always at the center of the the, uh, the, the spin coder, I mean, the axis. No, is... it's just, you have a film. So we use a lithography pattern surface. A pattern has oh, okay. large rings, right? So the rings, okay. the trench is 150 nanometer, 200 nanometer, 500 nanometers. And then we put the polymer in there and the polymer has a periodicity in maybe like tens of nanometers and the polymer inside has a nanoparticle. So this, the nanoparticle, the plasmonic peak give you this uh, okay. uh, optical. Uh, okay, so sounds good. So that, yeah. uh, that actually answered my first question. So that's okay. uh, great. Thank you. All right, thanks, yeah. Can I ask a quick related mm -hmm. question? So yeah. has anyone tried for X-ray, like, uh, you know, this, um, uh, this uh, you know, Fraunhofer, uh, you know, the, uh -huh. the, like you shine the X-ray through this pattern. Are you gonna get the typical that you get with light? You know, the um, focusing yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I want yeah, someone to be... try it. That's the thing. It's like we can make this, but you know, like a real then... zone plate. Yeah, zone plate for X-ray. I know. Right? Yeah, yeah. So okay. we want people to try. If you know someone, do it. It's just the student left because uh, you know, they have to graduate, and then for us, we move on. 
right? So yeah, you know, yeah. If someone want to try, we want people to try because making it is super easy for us. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. We Thanks. might think yeah. about it. Let's talk yeah. later. Okay. okay. Sounds thank good. You. We can put all sorts of particle in there. No problem. All right. Great. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Let's let's move to the third and the last speaker in the morning session. Uh, um, Mike, can you uh, uh, Ting, you probably have to unshare your screen. I think she is unsharing. Oh, okay. That uh, work. You should see this. Yeah, okay. Um, Mark Tony is a professor of chemical and biological engineering and material science and engineering and a fellow of the uh, uh, Renewable and uh, Sustainable Energy Institute at the University of Colorado Boulder. He got his PhD in physics from University of Washington way back. After NATO uh, postdoc fellowship, uh, he joined the IBM research division to focus on developing X-ray scattering methods for polymer thin films and interfaces. And he then moved to SSRL and later became the head of material science division. The so professor Tony is a pioneer in the use of X-ray diffraction methods for in situ investigations of atomic structures of organic thin films for energy applications. So he's a fellow of American Physical Society and a uh, uh, Thomson Reuters highly cited researcher in material science. So please, Professor Tony. Great, thanks. Thanks for the introduction, except for maybe the way back. Um, <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. <laughs> You know, I was just back at, at RD8 last summer, and Suresh reminded me that I had not been there for literally for 20 years. Um, so maybe way back is appropriate. Um, so I, I, this is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to, it's really not so much thoughts about XP, XPCS, but more thoughts about particularly how some of the challenges associated with services and interfaces, particularly buried interfaces. And then I won't even think they're quite at the thought level yet, but maybe laying out some problems that hopefully XBCS could start to start to kind of address. Um, so it's more here are some problems. Hopefully we can come up with collectively come up with some solutions. Um, so I'll very briefly talk about what I see as some of the problems with a focus really on electrochemical energy storage or more broadly um, energy storage in general. And then I'll finish with the question of, you know, can XPCS help? So I'll be actually showing you some real data. So some of this came from JCZ at a Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. And some of this came from the Vehicles Technology Office, part of EERE. -E -E. um, so this is kind of one of the slides I use uh, for introducing batteries. Um, I'm not going to go through the introduction, but more point out you have a cathode, you have an anode, I'll briefly talk about those, lithium ions shuttle back and forth. Um, and then in this very nice article from George Crabtree that was published almost five years ago, he lays out some of the, the challenges, driving range, cost, charging time, and stability. I won't really address stability, but you can kind of get three of the two of these three, but not the third. Unfortunately, George sadly passed away a month or so ago, um, but um, since there are a number of Argonne folks on the, on the line, I just wanted to acknowledge the impact that he had on me as a scientist and in, in actually in guiding parts of my career when I was considering going to Argonne and, and indeed beyond that. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that um, it partly is, is bringing this up. In any case, if you look at these, I know, economic or technical challenges, they basically get down to largely two problems. One of these has to do with interfaces. We want to, we want to kind of uh, de develop interfaces that's selective and stable. And the other one gets to do with particle degradation. So what happens for uh, these, these are particular electrodes. So this picture up here is, is a simplification, but they consist of particles. The particles will expand and contract and isotropically as you delithiate and lithiate them. That creates stresses. You can have expansion, twisting, and bending. Basically, the particles can start to um, basically fall apart um, and become detached from the electrodes. And that's one of the primary loss mechanisms. The other one has to do with interfaces. So this is kind of a schematic picture, what you might think of as an electrode. So here's one of the, this is a um, 
an anode, so it's presumably it's graphite. Um, th there are interfaces all throughout this, um, and then developing interfaces that are selective, uh, that I'll talk about a little bit in a minute, but let ions pass through, but not electrons pass out, and then are stable. It don't degrade over time are, are two of the primary challenges that, that one has in the battery field. Um, so unfortunately, the next part doesn't really work if I'm not in person, but at this point, I would ask um, the community, what did I miss? Um, it doesn't really work in a Zoom format, so I'm just going to go ahead and answer that. Um, but what is missing in this, which is probably the talk I would have ended with, say, five years ago, um, is supply chain and earth abundance and local manufacturing. I think one of the things that became evident in the pandemic, if anybody actually tried to buy something, um, is there severe limitation to the supply chain. Um, and so that pushes kind of a, um, a desire to move away from materials that are not earth abundant um, and that can be made here. And then I won't really discuss this too much, but recycling and sustainability is a big issue that kind of comes as well. So these are again just kind of general comments for electrochemical energy storage. So I'm going to focus um, kind of in the rest of the discussion um, uh, in terms of interfaces. Um, and so if we now take a step back um, from kind of this, this schematic picture of a battery and think about uh, electrified buried interfaces, something that I actually have been uh, interested in for what was the term a very long time maybe, or way back, something along those lines, this kind of shows the picture of an electrode. Um, so what you see here, let's see if I can do this. Come on. So here's a solid surface. Uh, this is our electrode. Um, and here is the electrolyte as it sits uh, kind of above, above the surface. They're anions, sorry, they're cations. So this is some cation, this is an anion. And then their solvent molecules shown by basically the blue and the green. These are basically carbonates but you can pick any electrolyte. It's gonna kind of have a similar, similar kind of uh, flavor. You will see kind of a distribution of ions and molecules as you move away from the surface. At least in this context, these are pretty, clear, uh, pretty clearly layer, uh, layered. If we then go ahead and, and say we charge the surface, let's imagine we're gonna charge it positively. You will then build up. Basically, if we plot distance kind of on the x-axis, and concentration, in this case, let's think about this as concentration of the anions. Um, on the y-axis, um, you know, you're going to have some bulk level somewhere way out in the solution. And then you're going to have some buildup limited by my ability to draw uh, the anions and perhaps their specific absorption so they stick here. Um, okay, there we go. In any case, this, as I think you're all familiar with, is called the electrochemical double layer. Um, and it's very important, uh, not only for lithium ion batteries, but also for kind of uh, physical chemistry or catalysis or anything that involves electrified interface, which is a huge amount of kind of um, use inspired or techno te technologically inspired science. Um, so in the folk, if you think about this from the electrochemical energy storage pers perspective, this is very important because we're gonna move an eye on here that's happily solvated across the interface and it's gonna intercalate into, into the solid surface. And so exactly what happens at that interface is actually crucially important. So how these um, uh, solvent molecules, how the, the cations and anions are arranged can have a big impact on that. And perhaps the strongest or a strong uh, manifestation is that if you have preferential absorption of one of the species, they can block some other reactive species from ever getting to the surface. And then you can create kind of kinetically stabilized, effectively kinetically stabilized uh, windows that, for example, can, can expand the, the stability window for water. Um, you know, the double layer has been known for a long time, but there still is limited information on this. We don't really have a good sense of, of kind of what's going on this from a static case even. And then that gets back down to, okay, from a dynamic perspective, what are the time scales that are associated with, with these various processes, with the formation of the double layer, the transition, uh, the exchange between uh, electrolyte molecules here and electrolyte molecules that are in the bulk of the solvent. 
uh, there's not a lot of experimental data on, on that. So that kind of begs the question of whether we can potentially use something like XPCS to go after this. Um, so we and a number of others, actually some of these written down here have, have been investigating this. This is um, work that was done by my postdoc. I don't know if it's down here. Yeah, Hans Georg Steinruf, who is now a professor at the University of Paderborn in Germany. Um, and this shows basically the layering of the of carbonate-based electrolyte at an interface that was deduced from some X-ray reflectivity. In this case, we had no potential applied here. So this is basically a nice inert um, substrate. In this case, it was sapphire. Here's the reflectivity curves. Um, and here's kind of the electron density profile that come out. So this is, for example, layering of electrolytes, and we can deduce some impact uh, of what happens when you change the salt concentration um, kind of as a function, uh, how, how the layering changes as you change the salt concentration. Um, of course, that's not really electrochemistry because the surface is insulating and can't really apply potential. Um, so recently we've done some experiments and this was led by Sam Marks, picture shown here at the ESRF, um, where we were, we we're um, adopting a conductive substrate. In this case, I'm showing you some perichloride um, kind of electrolyte. Um, and here's some hypothetical arrangement of the, the cell as we apply as we bias the potential negatively. Uh, this is now a reflectivity curve uh, as a function of potential from about one volt down to about minus one volt. And you can pretty clearly see this is uh, there's a strong change in basically the uh, the reflectivity, which is a manifestation of the details of of what's going on in the electrochemical double layer. These data are quite new, so we don't quite have a complete picture of what's going on here. But what is interesting, and frankly, um, I don't completely understand. I don't think we completely understand. But if we plot, if we basically stick the potential here, so if we hold the potential here and basically then collect the reflectivity, so sitting at one um, kind of incidence angle and reflected angle, and then record the reflectivity as a function of kind of potential as we do basically a cyclical tamogram, this is what we get. So the blue now is the CV, so that's the current density measured over here. There's a bit of a slope, um, but you see, largely, although not completely, capacitive times of behavior. And then the dots um, here are the um, basically the um, x-ray intensity background subtracted um, as we basically move down this way, and then we move back this way. And so I was, I am uh, quite surprised by this because I would have expected that on the time scale of the measurement, so this is the 30 millivolts per second, probably collecting for a couple of seconds. Um, I would have expected at these kind of uh, scan rates that the, the double layer response would be completely reversible. Um, so what we see here is a large hysteresis. We've looked at a number of electrolytes, um, but it suggests that the times, some time scale that's associated with whatever this layering process is, is actually decently slow. I would have anticipated it's on like RC time constants, which are typically microseconds, um, which typically associated with the double with expectations of the double layer. But pretty clearly here, we're seeing much longer time scale. And in this paper here that was done uh, on some data that was taken by, by Hoi to you, where they would do potential jump experiments on platinum surfaces, they actually see time constants that are also quite slow. Um, so what this might suggest is that we actually have time constants within this that are slow and potentially start to approach the regime that's associated with XPCS. So this might give us the potential now to be able to probe those, those dynamics, or whatever those kinds of dynamics are that are associated with this kind of layering at the electrolyte. Um, so anyway, that's a potential problem. That I'm just going to throw out there as being the potential that potentially XPCS could help us solve. Um, so that's a double layer part. If we go back to our battery picture, often, or maybe often is probably a good word, um, the potentials that are associated with the cathode, which is a highly oxidizing potentials, and the potentials that are associated with the anode are outside the stability regime of the electrolyte. Um, and so this can then basically drive strongly reductive processes on the anode. 
um, where you can break down the electrolyte and form a, uh, uh, form a film. Um, and likewise on the cathode, you can have changes here. Um, and that gets back to kind of this challenge I noted before in terms of this, these films have to be selected and they have to be stable. You can't continually build these up. Um, and this is now a picture of uh, one of those films. So what happens in is the potential goes down on the anode. You have this double layer structure and it evolves into this complex um, kind of buildup of reaction products. Um, this is, these tend to be decently complex and it's despite the fact there've been many, actually I think tens of thousands of papers of, if I believe Bob Gost, uh, Robert Gostecki on this subject, the nature of this is not particularly well-defined still. Um, but how this forms and more interesting, how the ions actually transport through this are big questions. And again, I don't, don't know if this is even tractable, but if there's potential for XBCS to address problems like what are the transport mechanisms through this, this kind of more complex layer um, and you know, what gives rise to this selectivity, that would be kind of dramatic. So this is on the anode side. This is the graphite associated with the anodes in all your cell phones. Uh, on the cathode side, we have kind of similar things. So here's our bulk electrolyte. Here's a double layer. This is at some lower potential. Here's the cathode. These are typically transitional oxides. Uh, so this is nickel, manganese, cobalt um, oxide. So what happens here as you go to highly oxidative conditions is now this layered structure forms a rock salt. Um, kind of a structure, you use oxygen, and then you still build up this kind of complex um, kind of uh, cathode uh, uh, oxidative products um, from the electrolyte. Um, and then you have to have transport of lithium ions back and forth, and you have to prevent electrons through here. So I, I bring this up because aspects of this are still poorly understood. Um, so um, I think the open questions then for these interface regions then are what gives rise to selectivity, what gives rise to stability, and then ultimately, if we can understand these, how do we control these? Um, so if I go back to this, and again, this is a question for, for those of you who understand XPCS far better than I do. Um, can we use specular reflectivity, which is a very simple uh, measurement? Um, uh, it, gets, it has decently high signal, so that's a big advantage. Can we use this to start to interrogate um, the aspects of electrochemical double layer going back maybe to this picture here? Um, or more broadly, can we start to look at kind of the dynamics that are associated with ion transport? In this layer, actually, this is a more general question as well. I know it's not the topic necessarily for uh, this particular workshop, but I think as a general question, you know, there's a potential to use XPCS both at free electron lasers and elsewhere to kind of get at aspects that are associated with, with, ion, with ion transport at both a more macroscopic scale as, as well as potentially a more microscopic scale. So that's it. Um, I mean, we are continuing to push along these directions. Sam is shown over here, so he's kind of led a lot of this. And then Emma has participated as well. And I have a couple other students who are starting to get interested in from a number of different kind of perspectives. And again, the funding for this came from Jay Caesar as well from um, uh, the Vehicles Technology Office of ERE. And last, I'll happily take any questions if there are some. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah. Um... I think we are back on time. So we have 15 minutes uh, discussion session. So if you have any questions for any of our, you know, morning session speakers, please unmute yourself and uh, uh, and uh, ask your questions. Maybe a quick question for Tony. <laughs> How, what kind of thicknesses does the SCI layer get up to? And uh, does it build, um, how many cycles does it take to get to, you know, some, some kind of equilibrium thickness? Uh, I don't think, 
So it it will form the first time you 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 move into a regime where the electrolyte is unstable. Um, and the thickness question is an open question. You know, aspects of this are not well resolved. You know, one of the things that we have done is to show you have a lithium fluoride layer that can form with about a nanometer thick, with about a nanometer thickness. I think we see the formation of this, whether it has an impact on transport or not, I think is an open question. Um, after repeated cycles, the, the layer will continue to grow. It's not obvious necessarily what the components of this are. There certainly is an organic part of this, which could grow quite thick, and potentially. Um, it also can be at least potentially heterogeneous. Um, but roughly speaking, uh, one to maybe 10 nanometers, perhaps as much as, as, as 50 nanometers are kind of conventional wisdom. So that's pretty good in terms of extra reflectivity range, right? I mean, yes. want, okay. Yes. Yes. But you'd probably get just a RMS roughness as the main, given your diversity of composition, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's probably right. I mean, you know, I forgot to mention, but one of the things that we've done is take a reductionist approach here, which is to use kind of single crystals and try to tune this in a way that we can eliminate some of this uh, polymer mess that necessarily forms. Mm -hmm. um, but even the dynamics that are associated with that, I think, well, first of all, we don't know what it is, but the dynamics that are associated with that and are not known. Um, and then, of course, the impact of those dynamics on, on transport are also not particularly well known. If right. you think about transport in like iron, like polymers that are used for, for transporting ions, right, the dynamics and these free volume concepts and all things like this start to come in. Now, in this, you know, less defined polymer, all of these questions now become more complicated because you don't really understand the polymer structure. But I think yeah. these are all kind of related in some way. Okay. Hey, Hua, you have a question for oh, Mike? Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, it's not a question, just some discussion or comments. So, I, I think, yeah, my, 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 Mike is right. I mean, you know, to, about the SEI. But, yeah, I think right now, probably, you know, most uh, relevant study, you have to using very model system, either single crystal uh, electrode, single crystal substrate. And also, uh, you know, probably you have the using very low currents, you know, a current rate, you know, to make sure the, the SEL layer is uniform. Because in reality, for real battery, or even even you're using a, some like a, 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 you know, a thin film battery, I think the, the tricky thing is uh, the, the, this SEL layer is not so uniform and not so smooth. So I, I little doubt it, you know, for reality, you know, a more relevant to reality electrode, you can get any meaningful reflectivity because the surface is very rough. Because from from TEM, you can see that sometimes you know the interface is quite rough, and also the 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 thickness of this SEL layer is quite homogeneous. So I don't know, you know, probably you're gonna see a lot of diffuse scattering. I think a diffuse scattering we're gonna see, but the very good reflectivity in many cases probably not easy to obtain. But yeah, using a model system. Substrate, I think that that's not a problem. Like uh, you know, like Mike already you know demonstrated. So, but uh, because we we try something very similar using leucine cobalt oxide as one of the you know a prototype of substrate. This is a not single crystal. This is not powder. This is like a epitaxial using MBE or PLD to grow the film. So so even that as a surface is still pretty rough in some sense. But uh, yeah, but I think that it's it's quite challenge. You know, it's quite challenge. But uh, but I agree. So there are some probably way maybe GI XPCS maybe can help because we're gonna probably see a lot of diffuse scattering. We just uh, right now we didn't really pay much uh, more attention. So I think that's a thing I I, I really comment that because the uh, the, the SEL layer they have a lot of a uh, 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 disorder things. So you have a very you know short range ordering feature. You have an intermediate range ordering feature. So I probably we need to really go to very broad risk space to looking for a useful feature to collect XPCF data. So that's my that's my comment. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would agree with all those all the statements Juan made.
Uh, Jean, you have some comments? Uh, yeah. So uh, I got a question for uh, 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 Mike. Uh, Mike, good. Very nice to see you. Uh, uh, it's definitely been a while. <laughs> Last time when I see you, you were still in at the STEM, uh, SSRL, so uh, Slack. So, but anyway, so uh, uh, so this is uh, you know the barium uh, uh, chloride uh, saw solution uh, in contact with uh, the substrate uh, for the uh, the. Uh, uh, the double layer experiment is a really, really uh, nice. Uh, so I, uh, so it remind me some uh, experiments a uh, uh, long time ago when I was graduate student. Uh, uh, we did the, you know, these uh, uh, standing wave experiments to look at the double layers uh, uh, <clears throat> with the uh, zinc chloride, you know, at the yeah. membrane surfaces. So that, the, so maybe this is a, a potential. Uh, uh, you know, uh, experiment, you know, to, and uh, this is a quite a surprising uh, is that that uh, you have, uh, you know, these uh, uh, looks like a, some kind of a monolayer forming at the, the uh, or, or layer, uh, concentrated the layer forming at the, the surface. Uh, so from that uh, kind of, a, you know, uh, uh, the time scale, so do you can you give an estimate, you know, so how big are the, uh, you know, what is it called? Like a, a radius of, of a hy hydrated, uh, you know, uh, uh, cluster or, uh, you know, how, how big that can be, you know, so. Yeah, that's, we, no, I don't, I don't, this data, these data are very, very fresh. So I don't have a good answer for this. Um, I mean, in principle, right, we can get concentration of barium on the surface and you know you can make some estimate for how big a barium ion is either hydrated or not hydrated and then by comparing that to the area aerial density you get right number of barium atoms per, per centimeter squared you can make an estimate for how hydrated it is laterally right um but we have not done that yet okay um, but in principle that that that's a tractable thing and that is in fact one of the goals here um, there is some suggestion that if you move beyond the barium layer, there's something else going on um, too, which may be a manifestation of whatever the second ionized, second charged layer is doing in response to the negative charge, the negative charge, positive charge, negative charge. Um, but I think that's remains to be seen depending on, on kind of the results we get. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds very, very interesting. So the other question is that the, I mean, uh, uh, for the uh, the uh, the uh, SEI, you know, so that the so, uh, so all these uh, uh, materials, uh, you know, elements are pretty light, you know. So um, so do you expect to see a good contrast or everything, you know? So to you know to look at the uh, the uh, the scattering. Well, no, not from the SCI in contact with an organic electrolyte. I mean, the yeah. densities are about the same. So, so that would be they could make a hard experiment even harder. Um, but there is an organic contribution to this is inorganic contribution is this as well, and that can have a significantly higher electron density. That does, I mean, we've shown that it does give you contrast, even to the tune of kind of a nanometer thickness. Um, and, you know, there are clever ways like I think Paul Fenter and others have done, you know, by having like an environment above the sample that might work uh, a humid environment for mineral surfaces that might kind of be tractable in this situation kind of too. Um, so it's not impossible to kind of think about something like this. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Um... Let me continue on Jin's question, just last one, which is a very nice talk, Mike. Um, I was on the barium chloride experiments. I was just wondering if there would be any hope of a, a grazing incidence wax experiment or something to to maybe see some of the. Yeah, if yeah, if, I mean, if you go back to the experiment that Hoidu published in 2018, um, they did that and they would see some a two by two lattice. I don't remember what the absorbed layer was on it. Um, 
but they saw a formation of a of a of a uh, kind of uh, two by two. Well, you don't know. It's some kind of a two by two is, is to uh, you know, which presumably is a result of the ion adsorption. I, I mean, we have to kind of get a sense of what the density is, and from that, if it's ordered, then and potentially you can definitely see that. Um, I mean, if you go back to the UP stuff we did when I got into interfacial electrochemistry, you know, many decades ago, um, we see very strong signals from, from this for things like lead, um, uh, with single layers of lead on, on dust really matter, the substrate, things like copper, things like silver and gold. Okay. Um, but all this was static, right? At that time, we didn't really know how to do dynamics or certainly formation and phase transition aspects of this that were interesting that never got to be explored. Um, but yeah, that that kind of an experiment certainly is tractable. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if there is uh, no more questions or comments, let's uh, wrap up the morning. Oh, Jean, you have something to say? No, I, I actually, you know, uh, uh, so I should should not be interrupt you. Uh, you know, so it's kind of a delay here. So, so you want to close the uh, 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 Mike's talk, and and then we have a general questions. So, you know, for previous speakers and all. This. Is that what you? Yeah, I mean. Uh... Okay, I'll, I'll lower my yeah, hand. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, and... we can we still can take a couple more questions if we have, you know, for other speakers. Okay. So I have a question for uh, Professor Corrine. So that the, uh, so one of the, uh, you know, uh, interesting thing you showed there is that the thickness for this, uh, uh, let's see what that might notice so that the, so the PS uh, be a uh, PMMA so that the in the films that the you know uh, so you uh, use it for uh, uh, you know the water filtration so that the so uh, you showed definitely show the uh, the uh, the thickness dependent of a morphology right. and so you have a uh, you know the thinnest you have there is a is a fifty nanometers right so that the, where you show uh, you see, saw very nice ordering, and uh, and the next one will be uh, uh, is uh, is a hundred nanometer. Right. Uh, so then you have uh, these loops and all stuff going on. So, uh, so the question is, uh, uh, do you uh, think you know fine tuning of the thickness would help to you know achieve uh, well uh, a better uh, morphology? Let's say you know controllable way of uh, putting you know how these uh, you know channels what the uh, meandering you know in 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 the film right so that this so uh, so for academic uh, view is that the, you know if they have an ordered film <laughs> you know the the uh, structure it'll be really nice to to do experiment you know so that. The, but the, so it may not be, you know, uh, the best thing for the, uh, uh, you know, for the water filtration. So, but anyway, so, uh, so what that the, you know, fine tuning of the thickness or the help to, you know, to, uh, to achieve, uh, you know, uh, the tuning of the uh, the, uh, yeah, of no, the morphology. So it's a great question. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it actually makes a really big difference um, in the sense that, firstly. If you read up, you know about membrane uh, fluxes, um, the thickness, you know, controls it like to the fourth power or something. So, if you double the thickness, your flux goes down by a factor of you know eight or something like that. So, in terms of pressure head needed, so it makes a big difference. Um, on the other hand, you get more selectivity through a longer you know channel. Right. So, um, yeah, it's it's a really good question, and we should make, you know, I'm um, I'm um, I'm. Trying to get back into my what I used to do at NIST was 
combinatorial high throughput, right? So make <laughs> gradient films and all that and right. find the optimum. Absolutely. So, but I think uh, in addition, um, we could think about uh, fields to align um, like, like, like for these ionic liquid films, I think I want to actually go back to Tom Russell's original E-field driven vertical orientation. Uh, but now with a liquid, it should be occurring at much lower voltages, I think. So if I can actually get 100 nanometers straight vertical uh, with a low field because of the ionic conductivity of ionic liquid, I think that could be really interesting as well. You know, So combinatorial gradient approach to sort of map it out uh, in, in like a single sample gives you all the orientations. You, know, you do GSACs at different locations uh, and it's sort of very straightforward. And then the second thing would be, can I apply some E field or something like that to assist with that uh, you know, longer, uh, vertical orientation correlation length, you know. Uh, but from the um, membrane perspective, the, we have to deal with the issue of, you know, again, it's the flux versus selectivity, but now you have the new thing about the pressure, hydrostatic pressure to drive the liquid goes up uh, quite a lot. So maybe, you know, you have to think about length versus diameter. You know, you get flux higher, but you can reduce, uh, you know, you would uh, have a longer length for selectivity. So all these parameters at play that would ultimately govern, and it probably would be application specific. But yes, I mean, we want to get there, be able to do that, and then see where, where what works best. Absolutely. But great, great idea. We are, uh, I told my student already to make some gradient thickness films. Uh, okay. So, so the other question, well, you, you mentioned this, you know, so I, you know, we had a, some kind of a, you know, a uh, great discussion with Tom, you know, a long time ago. So that, uh, so uh, when he was working on the, uh, the solving the nailing, so that the, so it's the same thing applied here is that the, so whether, you know, uh, those ordering starting from uh, top down or bottom up, you know, so that. <laughs> Very excellent question. Okay, so this is something we have to do in situ uh, on the beam line. Right. At any <laughs> so absolutely, absolute must at different angles of incidence, yeah. Uh, I, it's very interesting because um, generally you'd think it's from top down because that's what, uh, you know, Storm's science paper actually showed as well. Um, but I could imagine that the substrate plays a big, in fact, I didn't show pictures. We looked at the backside of different substrates, you know, silicon, polymer coated silicon, and then something else. Um, and there are variations, but it is by and large, 80% or higher is vertical orientation at the bottom. So if it is top down, I think I think the 50 nanometer is a good compromise of bottom up and top down meeting in the middle, you know, where okay. it's neutral from the bottom and it's top down. It's the uh, synergy of the two processes. Uh, but 100 decouples them. And that's then the no man's land in the middle where they meander. So that's my thought right now that I think that happens at the same time, bottom or in induced orientation control, but the solvent doesn't leave the film up on the bottom, it leaves from the top. So there is a top-down neutral surface. Um, and I think they meet in the middle so that the, the GSACs as a function of angle, not just critical, high critical, you know, above critical right. and below. Yes. We need, to do a, we need to think about continuously varying the angle yes. to probe different depths, you know? And that, and then maybe there's a way to actually subtract the previous angle from the higher angle, you know? <laughs> so this would be a new new method in terms of getting, how do I, because, you, you know, GSAC is going to integrate the signal intensity from the top down, but I want to, if I want a certain slab, can I actually subtract the, uh, the earlier angle, you know, in some sense, from yeah. the higher angle, right? So I, I think, uh, you know, your uh, film, well, we could talk about, I mean, uh, we're running yeah. out of time, so that, yeah, yeah. but the, we could talk about this because this is a, a very classic uh, yes. system that, the, you know, so that, the, uh, and that this is a great thickness to work with also, you know, so you right. can uh, incorporate the, you know, these uh, resonance effect all stuff, you know, to have a, a, uh, some kind of selectivity of which layer you already look at, you know. So Joe, so this is actually is a good, experiment for you, you know, so that the, uh, you know, one our beam line is up, you know, so that the, and, uh, exactly, you know. Yeah. If, you have, if you have the ability to selectively look at a certain depth, I mean, that would be fantastic. You know, yeah. I think, yeah. So, yeah. 
Uh, so Julia, you could uh, you know make a note of it so that uh, so you know so we could uh, uh, you know try those things. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, like like a differential G sax, I would call it. You know, something. Sure. That, you know, yes. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, those things are you know so so, so uh, you know we a uh, long time ago you know we worked with the, with the Tom, you know yeah. uh, with those things uh, to to you know. Uh, but anyway, so uh, very we nice. Uh, later, thank you but, very but much. Great question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so if you still have questions, you can unmute yourself. Maybe we can maybe spend another one or two minutes. Okay, um, if there is no more question, so uh, let's wrap up this morning session. Uh, let's give uh, every speaker a plus. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we will come back uh, about a 12, 15 Chicago time. Uh, that's about uh, uh, 20, 20 minutes uh, from now. Actually, 22 minutes from now. So, uh, yeah. So, okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, I'll invite our last speaker, Aditya Mohita, to, um, to please share share his slides. Um, hi, Aditya. Hi, Joe. How are you? Good, good. Okay. We see your slides, and it's great, and I can give you your introduction. So, yeah, wonderful. You know, Mohita is Associate Professor at Rice University in both chemical and biomolecular engineering, and also in the Department of Material Science and Nanoengineering. He earned his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Louisville and then moved to Los Alamos' Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies, where he first postdoc and then joined the staff. His research interests are in understanding and controlling photophysical processes and interfaces in layered 2D materials and the use of interface sensitive techniques to probe these processes. His talk today is entitled Light Induced Structural Dynamics in 2D Halide Perovskites. So, Please, Aditya, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you for uh, the invitation to this meeting. Uh, you know, working with uh, facilities like uh, the APS, but really across the United States has been really uh, the cornerstone of a lot of the work that we've done in understanding, uh, you know, structure property relationships in uh, halide perovskites and I think the previous speaker introduced uh, some of uh, these sections and so that's what I will be speaking about today uh, specifically I want to be talking about work that we've done um, at APS at ADIDE and some of this uh, also at Brookhaven uh, on understanding light induced structural dynamics in 2D halide perovskites and um, and one of the and, and this really th this work uh, speaks to again a very strong collaboration that we've had now really starting from 2016 and so uh, what what you will see is just a little bit of a history of how this collaboration and how what work has actually gone into this interesting 2D halide perovskite system um, from a perspective of uh, addressing the stability long term uh, stability of halide perovskite which has really been the bane of this technology for photovoltaics. Um, all right, so see if I can get going here. All right, so let me just begin by acknowledging uh, just the funding for this group, uh, Joe uh, and Esther, who just been instrumental, uh, and of course, all the collaborators that are listed here that we've been working on, and this is uh, now over about seven to eight years. And uh, I'll also share an interesting fact uh, that uh, you know, since I recently got tenured, has got me thinking about just uh, you know what what a size of a group should be and what should be the funding model and the business model of how you operate. Do you want a big group or a large group? I just want to say that uh, you know one of the things that I've realized is that a lot of uh, really interesting and creative work can happen in small groups and also with people who are really organically interested in the same type of problems that you are trying to solve. So I want to say that all these collaborators, you know, I've had no joint funding with any of these people uh, throughout my career, but yet we've had tremendous success and just, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, finding new science and, uh, and really publishing high impact papers. All right, so the story really starts here for photovoltaics. I, I hope this is not a repeat of what the previous speaker may have shown, uh, but nevertheless, really we are here bec uh, because, uh, you know, halide perovskites have shown um, incredible efficient devices, photovoltaic devices with efficiencies now surpassing that of single junction silicon solar cells. Uh, but very few times uh, curves uh, like the one on the right are shown here, where, uh, you know, if you take uh, typically a stability of a 3D perovskite solar cell, you will see that this uh, is a good device over 20%, but tends to uh, undergo degradation over about 500 hours uh, over time. And so this is really not acceptable if you're trying to, uh, you know, get a technology for photovoltaics to get on the roof, uh, put it on your roof for about 20 years or even 10 years for that matter. And so uh, since really the very beginning, we've uh, really realized that uh, one of the key challenges for halide perovskites is going to be concomitantly obtaining efficient devices, but, all, uh, but also uh, the ones which actually uh, are really durable. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of where uh, our story really starts. And uh, the bigger motivation for this is that uh, halide proskites offer you the opportunity to get to a levelized cost of electricity, uh, which is lower than, uh, you know, two cents a kilo kilowatt hour. And, and that would be quite uh, transformational because, in, you know, this is really driven by uh, increasing the efficiency of a single junction solar cell or even a tandem solar cell, which is now up to about 33% efficient. And so the efficiency is in the denominator. And as you increase this, your levelized cost of electricity goes down. And uh, this really comes about by uh, understanding new materials and new physics, uh, you know, of especially of these low cost technologies, which are solution processable um, and, uh, and can be produced at a much, much lower cost uh, than, than silicon. So uh, photovoltaics, I'll skip this slide. This is just the basic thing on you know, how a photovoltaic device works. And uh, But just for the interest of time, I, I will pass on this. So halide perovskites are, uh, you know, just it's a structure which has this ABX3 type uh, structure. And these have been around, for example, strontium titanate is an example uh, of, of this material. Um, and then of course came, came the halide perovskites uh, where, uh, you know, at the A side, this was replaced by an organic uh, cation like a former medinium or methyl ammonium, or it could also be something like a cesium. The B side had, um, you know, divalent metals like lead uh, and tin and even germanium, germanium in some cases. Uh, and then the, the X side had the halide ion instead of the oxygen for, you know, for example, for these some of these um, uh, ceramic like uh, strontium titanate like materials. Now, uh, if you mix all of these materials up and, and, and if you uh, measure what their tolerance factor is, basically it's just some ratio of the ionic radii. And if you get a value between 0.8 and 1, then you've successfully made a three dimensional perovskite. And so if you're on either of these edges of these numbers, then you, you don't get a, a perovskite phase. You may get something different, maybe a polymorph of this or something that's a different structural phase. Now, uh, in addition to this, if, if, I, if I add one more bulkier organic cation, for example, if I take uh, something like a butyl ammonium uh, cation, which has four carbon atoms, and if I put this into this mix, then what happens is that I do get my perovskite structure, but the, because this butyl ammonium is pretty large, it can't, can't quite fit into the cage. Uh, and so what you end up getting is, is a layered structure. It organizes like layers as it's shown in the picture here. And so what you have is the perovskite uh, octahedras, which is this typical ABX3 type structure. And then separating these uh, are these organic spacer layers. And so you end up getting this super lattice like structure um, which consists of this, uh, you know, if you will, the inorganic and the organic layer, uh, which is, uh, you know, in, in continues throughout. Now, an interesting thing about the structure is that you can actually now, uh, you can actually characterize it and you can see in this formula here, the N here refers to the number of octahedral layers that I have. And so, for example, in this picture that I'm showing, uh, N here, N value would be three, which is three layers of octahedra. And we'll refer to this as we uh, kind of go along. 
Now we can also make inorganic versions of this. And in fact, we've made some of these. These are kind of things like a cesium tin, iodide and chloride mixtures of this. And so it's possible to also grow these inorganic versions of this. And of course, inorganic oxide versions of these Rudelson popper phases also exist. Uh, they've, they, people have studied them for looking at correlated, uh, you know, interface physics, superconductivity and other, other things in the past. If you uh, look at the electronic structure, and so on the left, I'm showing you uh, the band structure of a 3D perovskite, and you can see that this is a direct band gap semiconductor uh, where the valence, the, the, the minimum uh, minima of the valence band and the conduction band meet at the gamma point. Uh, and it has got nice, uh, you know, dispersion. Uh, and so this has low effective masses, pretty good transport properties, good mobilities uh, in this material. If you look at the one on the right, which is the 2D perovskite, this has exactly the same type of a band structure. Uh, and so they are very similar because after all, the octahedra really, that's what forms the, the electronic bands in this material. And if you actually look at um, the dispersion in the out of plane direction, which is from the gamma to the X direction, you will see that you encounter flat bands. And that makes sense because you have this organic layer, which is most of the time not conductive. And so you get these flat bands. And of course, we'll come back to this um, uh, you know, as I as I go through this talk of how do we really induce um, transport in this direction, in this third direction, which is typically, uh, you know, which is typically insulating. All right. So uh, if you think about the synthesis of this, then, uh, you know, there was some really nice work that was done by Mercury Kanazidis and Hema Mala Karunadasa. Uh, and uh, just around the time when uh, people were interested in the 3D proskites, people, uh, you know, they, uh, these two groups demonstrated that you can actually grow um, a series of these types of proskites, which are which have these different n values, and you can really control them. So, for example, here I'm showing you a series which goes from n1 to n6, and you can see that through uh, solution processing, you can very uh, nicely, you know, control what the number of layers that you have. And you can go all the way to six. And I believe now there's also N7 and N8 and N9, uh, which are which become increasingly difficult to fabricate uh, as you go to these higher end values because the enthalpy of formation starts to become quite positive. Now, uh, as you can also imagine that as you are increasing these octahedra uh, number of layers, you are increasing the or you're decreasing the quantum confinement. And so your band gap starts to get lower and lower. Uh, and as you're tending towards this, N is equal to infinity or higher end value, which is basically like the 3D perovskite. And so this kind of manifests like this. So if you take an X-ray diffraction uh, pattern of these crystals that you made, uh, you'll get a pattern like this. And if you if you look at these low angle um, you know, planes, which are these 0K0, which are you know, along, the, along the Z direction here, uh, you can really characterize whether you made a crystal that is pure or impure. So, for example, if you look at, uh, say, an N2 crystal, I'm showing you the 0, 2, 0, 0, 4, 0, uh, these planes, and you can see that uh, for a crystal that is pure, you find that you have equally spaced 0K0 planes. Similarly, for three, you have three equally spaced uh, uh, you know, the peaks, which, are, uh, which tell you that this is a pure crystal. For four, you have the four, five, and so on. You can then take this pattern and then also perform an uh, you know absorbance uh, measurements on these crystals and and you can see you can see a nice ground state excitonic feature uh, and as you go from n1 to n6 you see that your you know exciton binding energy or the peak uh, you know height of these excitons kind of decreasing that makes sense because you're decreasing the quantum confinement in these materials. But then you also see that these are all very nice, you know, single ground, you know, single peaks, which uh, then correspond to the n value that you have. So by combining these two measurements, you can get a very good estimate of whether these crystal, the batch of crystals you made are, uh, are pure crystals, face pure, or do they have mixtures of other n values that exist? Now, in addition to these uh, Ruddleson popper phases, which are shown on the left, you also can make other sort of uh, slightly different uh, structural phases of these 2D perovskites. So you can have a phase which is, uh, you know, on the right, which is this Dion Jacobson phase. And you can see that the octahedra here sit right on top of each other. 
Whereas in the alternating cation, you see that they are offset in both, either in the X or in the Y direction. So if you can actually, if you can actually plot the A and the B directions uh, of this plane, you can see that the Jacobson Dion or the Dion Jacobson phase, uh, you know, this uh, uh, these both A and B are right lie right on top. And so X in the Y direction, there's no real offset. And so this is at origin. Uh, the Ruddles and Popper, they are offset in both X and the Y axis. The unit cells are offset there. And so you get, you can write, uh, you know, you have this offset of half and half. And then the alternating cation is either offset in X or in the Y direction. And, uh, and the question that we wanted to really ask is that by looking at or using some of these structural phases, can we really think about trying to induce charge transport uh, in a way so that it's similar to that of a 3D perovskite, which means which is out of plane in the out of plane direction, uh, where typically uh, these, the, the, uh, you know, the transport is blocked by these insulating cations. And so, uh, you know, when we started really working on these, this is really the first work that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that came out of the 2D perovskites, where we had shown back in 2016, that uh, we, the, 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 the 2D perovskites exhibit uh, much superior durability compared to the 3D perovskites, both under light illumination, and this is a device which went up to about 2,000 hours, uh, and also under humidity. Um, now, in addition to this, if you take the same device and, and, and drive an LED and really pump a lot of current into this, you can see that you can get an LED to go on, uh, you know, operate at about 1.5 amps per centimeter square, which is quite large. And you can see that you still don't see a degradation in this curve. Uh, and so, so these results uh, were quite encouraging uh, for us because this showed that if you actually made these 2D perovskites in the right way, then you could get much, uh, you could get really nice durable devices where you could pass semi, you know, pretty large currents into this. And really, whenever you whenever you start to you know inject a lot of current into devices, uh, then you know that you made a good quality semiconductor. Okay. And so since then, uh, there has been uh, you know this this field has kind of taken off, uh, and uh, people have been uh, you know trying to come up with ways in which you can combine or use the two D perovskites in combination with the three D perovskites in order to uh, you know really attain both uh, stability and efficiency. Uh, and so uh, there are different flavors of doing this. For example, people, what I call composites of 2D and 3D, what people uh, take the 2D cations or 2D proskites and they mix them in a bulk phase in, in the 3D film and they spin coat it. And this is often referred to as quasi 2D. Uh, or they can take these 2D cations and dope it into a 3D film. And, and the thought here is that these, uh, you know, organic cations end up in grain boundaries. Of course, it's, uh, you know, very few reports which actually demonstrate that these actually go to grain boundaries. Um, but these, these are what I call composites, and they, re they work reasonably well depending on how you actually made them. Uh, you do get an, uh, an efficient device, and you can improve this durability compared to a 3D film. Another method that has really caught a lot of attention is this idea of creating hetero interfaces. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, you take an organic cation and then you spin coat uh, the organic cation on a 3D perovskite film. And when you do that, this organic cation steals some of the lead iodide from your bulk film and forms a passivation layer, a very, very thin layer of 2D perovskite on top of this 3D film. Now, what you cannot control is the N value in this case. Uh, typically, you end up getting an N1 or sometimes even mixtures of N values that you get. And so you can't really control the electronic uh, you know, transport across these layers. And so typically, these types, this approach has limited the thickness of these 2D layers to be really of the order of 2 to 5 nanometers, where you can still sort of achieve transport across these layers um, because as you make them thicker, they start to get insulating pretty fast. Okay. So uh, we recently, and I won't spoke, speak about this, but we recently had this really nice paper on taking the 3D perovskites and putting down, deterministically putting down whatever 2D layer that we wanted on top in such a way that we can actually get uh, a really nice band alignment from the 3D to the 2D layers where they're actually uh, working like charge transport layers. 
And so when you do that, you can get pretty nice devices, 24, 25%. But uh, really the take home message is that you can get extremely high durability, which is shown in this curve, in this black curve here. This is the device which, you know, which we ran for about 2000 hours um, for about at about 60 degrees C, 70% uh, humidity, and really did not undergo any degradation. And if you compare that to either the 3D device or the 3D, 2D passivation layer that I showed about, showed you, or even the 2D control, you can see uh, that uh, uh, you know you kind of really synergistically can combine the advantages of the 2D, achieve, you know, get the stability of the 2D and get the efficiency from the 3D. Okay, and so uh, one of the things that uh, that we wanted to kind of uh, think about and uh, you know uh, explore is that uh, while these 2D perovskites are great, they exhibit excellent stability. Uh, but their efficiencies intrinsically remain low. And so the question we asked is that, can we really obtain 3D-like charge transport in the 2D perovskites and thereby increase their efficiency intrinsically, uh, but at the same time retain the stability that they, um, uh, that they have? And then, of course, second uh, uh, question that we wanted to ask more fundamentally is, what is the impact of light on structural dynamics in 2D perovskites? These are soft semiconductors. And so as soon as you, you know, uh, expose them to any kind of external stimuli, light or, uh, you know, temperature uh, or, you know, apply voltages, then they, they can undergo different structural uh, changes. And so that is something that we wanted to understand, again, from a long-term context of uh, achieving stability, stable devices. So uh, I think that, that that's the, that's what I'm going to be really talking about. And I have two topics here. These are recent papers on light-induced structural dynamics. I don't think I will get time to talk about the second work. This was work done at Slack and uh, recently just came out. Uh, but I want to talk about this work, which is light-induced lattice contraction in 2D perovskites. So um, the story starts here where we were looking at these photovoltaic devices. And uh, what we were actually seeing uh, is, uh, you, you know, changes which uh, uh, look like this. So uh, you take these three classes of the perovskites that I showed you, the Jacobson Dion, the alternating cation, and the Rudelson Popper. When we put light on this device and we monitored the different figures of merit, like the short circuit current, voltage, the fill factor, what we found is that in the cases where we had the Dion, Jacobson, and alternating cation, we were seeing these abrupt jumps in your voltage and your fill factor. And this is something that we did not really understand. This effect did not manifest in the Ralston Popper phase. And so I, you know, at that time we thought that this was some sort of a, uh, you know, measurement error or some kind of a circuit issue that we were uh, undergoing. And so, uh, you know, after having uh, my student repeat this multiple, multiple times, uh, we, we finally concluded that this was really real. And so uh, this is where we wanted to really understand what, what's really going on and understand uh, the structural uh, changes that may be undergoing when we expose this to an AM 1.5 solar sim, you know, simulated light. So um, we, of course, contacted Joe uh, and, and we set up this experiment where, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we, we looked at, uh, you know, the powders of the 2D perovskites. We looked at films of 2D perovskites and we also looked at single crystals of 2D perovskites. Uh, and we set up a solar simulator <clears throat> on 8IDE, the beamline, and and then had a temperature control stage. Uh, and we looked at uh, grazing in incidence uh, wax measurements uh, as a function of illumination. And so as we uh, were looking at this, and if you take one of the line cuts from, from, uh, from these GVAX patterns that we get over time, we found something quite interesting. What we found is that after about, uh, you know, as we kind of keep illuminating the samples, we see that all the entire pattern actually shifts to a higher Q value. Uh, and uh, this is a reversible effect. And so when the light is on, you get this. And then when you take the light off after some time, uh, this relaxes back, which is shown as this dotted line. So the green is the original one. That's what we start with. Uh, we uh, light soak it for about, uh, you know, in some amount of time. Uh, we get this uh, contraction uh, in the real space uh, of the lattice. Uh, and then after, after, if you take the light off, then it relaxes back and goes back to its original position. <clears throat> 
And so we wanted to understand uh, what was really going on in both, uh, you know, the in-plane and the out-of-plane directions. And so we looked at these uh, specific planes, the 300 and 011, which is the in-plane axis. Uh, and so if you look at these, uh, these two planes, which are shown in circles here, what we found is that we could actually track this effect. So you can see uh, that this with light, you can see an increase in the Q, um, uh, Q values in both cases. And then uh, over time, uh, you know, you, you keep doing this. Um, if, in addition to this, we also see another little phase, which is marked as a P here, uh, which emerges and starts to get stronger. However, what we found is that this phase does not is not as reproducible and is very sample dependent. And we think so this is some kind of a polymorph phase, which tends to occur when you have a very specific type of sample, uh, which is being used. And it wasn't as reproducible. So I won't really talk about um, this specific polymorph phase, but we will focus on this effect of this light induced contraction uh, in these uh, in these materials. <clears throat> So uh, looking at this, the first thing we wanted to look at is the light, uh, you know, the lattice parameter. And so we plotted the out of plane lattice parameter and the in plane lattice parameter. This shows that over time, both of these are sort of contracting. And then we can actually plot uh, really the normalized strain. Uh, and what we found is that, in fact, that the lattice contraction is much stronger in the out of plane direction, about two times stronger than in the in plane direction, which is shown here by the blue plot, uh, whereas the this yellow plot is showing you the one in the in plane direction. The next thing we wanted to look at is that if we are indeed bringing these layers closer, what is the change in the interlayers, right? Because eventually you want, and this is of course interesting from also a fundamental perspective of looking at photophysics and you know excitations across these layers. And but of course, from a perspective of transport, um, we wanted to see if we were actually bringing these layers close enough where we could then induce a transport channel in this out of plane direction. <clears throat> and so we plotted the ex, uh, the effective interlayer distance, and we got this by looking at the D300, which is this spacing here. This is the distance, lattice distance for the out of plane uh, uh, 300. Uh, and then we subtracted that uh, with the three times the, uh, the D111, which is this one here. So three times of that, and that gave us this distance, this uh, interlayer distance, which is shown on the right here. And you can see that we go from about 4.15 angstroms to about four angstroms in this case. Now, uh, if we actually looked at all the different structures of the 2D perovskite, we found that there was a definite correlation with the interlayer iodine distance. So, and so what we have is the apical sites here are iodide sites. And so what we found is in the cases where the interlayer distance was short, uh, for example, in the Dion Jacobson uh, and the alternating cation, we were able to see this effect of this light induced lattice contraction. Whereas in the case where the interlayer distance was large, like the Ruddleson Popper phase, we really did not see this light induced uh, interlayer contraction. So we wanted to really understand what was really going on, what was causing this light induced uh, contraction. And so we performed uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And again, this was an in-situ measurement uh, performed here at Rice University, where uh, you would put light on the sample, uh, look at the XPS uh, patterns, uh, and uh, and then again do the same experiment and look at what was really happening to the you know bonding sites for the PB4F and the iodine 3D orbitals. And so we did this experiment on a Jacobson Dion phase film, and you can see that uh, uh, you know uh, the gray one here is the initial uh, state of the film. Once we put light on this film, you see that uh, you see a shift in this curve by about 0.26 electron volts uh, towards it is blue shifting towards higher energies. The same thing happens also with the lead 4F orbitals, where you see that you know everything shifts slightly by a lower amount. Whereas in contrast, you see that this Ruddleson pop of in the Ruddleson pop of phase, you don't see any real shift. And so, based on this, we came up with uh, a, you know a model of what was really uh, really going on. And so, we can actually understand this from the perspective of you know oxidative coupling uh, in uh, you know polyiodide molecules. So let me walk you through that. 
So uh, here I'm showing you in uh, two iodine uh, molecules and when they are really too far away, there is no real interaction. And this would be very similar to the case where you have a Rulson popper phase. Uh, these iodides don't really interact. Now, uh, uh, you know, in the dark case, again, uh, you have uh, these Dion Jacobson phases uh, and you can see uh, that about 4.1, 4.16 angstrom there, these are about Van der Waals gaps. And again, under dark, you have very little uh, or small interactions. Now, when you actually put light on the material, you get a photo excitation from the, uh, you know, the iodide uh, antibonding to the lead uh, antibonding orbital. Uh, and so what you're doing is you are slightly reducing the negative charge on your iodide. And uh, what happens is that you start to now get interactions between these two iodide molecules, uh, you know, through a partial sort of oxidative coupling. And so th this is a sort of a mechanism that is quite well known in catalysis. And so you get this partial bond formation upon light illumination. And then when you really take the light away, you again restore equilibrium, uh, you know, and get back to this, uh, you know, your original distance of about 4.1 angstrom. And of course, the extreme case of this would be a full oxidation where these, uh, you know, these iodines would be so close that they would actually form a K-covalent bond. And so we are, of course, not in this regime at all. Okay. Now, if you're a theorist, you can think of this as actually putting positive charges uh, or, you know, localized, you know, like polarons, or, or if you will, on, on, you know, on, on the iodide sites. Uh, and uh, this, and if you actually do that, and if you calculate the band structure in the out of plane direction, which is from this gamma to the X direction, what you find is that you start to now see uh, increase in the slope or you start to get more dispersion in the out of plane direction. If you remember in the beginning, I showed you that typically this dispersion is pretty flat in this direction. Um, but now with light soaking, as you're bringing these layers closer, you start to get uh, things which are, uh, you know, which uh, tend to have a much higher dispersion. And so this means that you, you, you may have opened up a transport channel in this direction, or you would have higher propensity to have charge transport across these layers. And so in order to understand this, we looked at uh, the impact of, uh, you know, this light induced contraction uh, on the, uh, on the carrier mobility and the conductivity. <clears throat> And so in order to do that, we performed a space charge limited photocurrent measurement. The idea here is that you make a device which only transports electrons, but presents a barrier for the holes. So the band diagram is shown here. So you can select your layers such that you only have electrons that can go through the circuit. Um, whereas the holes, they actually, uh, they have barriers for this. And so they create a space charge within this device. And so they really impede transport there. Uh, and so what happens is that what you end up getting is uh, in, if you look at your current voltage curves under illumination, you start to get the saturation region, which otherwise would have been quite linear uh, and would be increasing. You wouldn't see this in the dark. And so this slows down this, you know, this, this current, uh, you know, increase slows down. And so it changes to a factor of about V to the power of half as opposed to V1 in the dark. And so now using this idea, you can actually extract the mobility and also the conductivity from the linear region, which is the ohmic reg region of this curve. And so if you perform these measurements as a function of light soaking, just like we perform the structural measurement, you see that over time in about after about five to 10 minutes of photo excitation or illumination, you start to see these jumps in your conductivity. Uh, in the ohmic region, coming from the ohmic region, and also in the electron mobility. And so if you look at the mobility, you see that you get about three times increase in your mobility, which over time then saturates. Now, interestingly, um, we can also, there is also a light dependence of this effect, which means that if you actually increase the, the photo excitation uh, uh, density to about five suns, you can accelerate this light induced contraction. You can see that as we go from about half suns uh, to about uh, five suns, you can almost instantly get this effect to go, uh, you know, where you get an increase in your mobility and then you saturate. And so based on this idea that you are actually trapping your holes from the iodide case upon photo excitation, you can come up with a very simple type of a model, which is based on just hole trapping, uh, just like you would use in a semiconductor where you have the holes being trapped by a defect state. <clears throat> and uh, you can end up with a curve, which looks uh, something uh, which is shown here. And... Uh, 
and you can see that for all these excitations, there is a certain amount of trap photo hole density that you need, which is about 10 to the seven photo holes. And so this is all very reminiscent of, you know, for example, uh, you know, if you had a film of polymer and if you're trying to dope, uh, you know, metal particles or conductive particles in it, um, then uh, this is very reminiscent of a percolation type of a threshold where, where you hit a certain concentration of, uh, you know, conductive particles and you start to form channels uh, in your material, which can then increase your transport. And so what's happening by doing this is after light excitation, uh, you are opening up the channel uh, and you're able to get much better transport. Okay. Now, finally, I just have a couple of more slides. In order to really sort of uh, show that this was uh, you know, really happening uh, and this was really responsible for, the, for these jumps that we were seeing in the solar cells, jumps in efficiency and voltage and fill factor, we performed an in-situ measurement again. Uh, we took a device, uh, and we mounted that. We performed the same measurements as a, and, and, and monitored their structure as we were monitoring also uh, its uh, photovoltaic uh, properties. And so on doing that, what you find is that just when you see a jump in your photovoltaic device, which is shown here in the voltage in the current, you also start to see this interlayer contraction. And so that's kind of where we, uh, where you start to see this increase in your, in your, in your efficiencies. And we think that as you start to get this contraction, you he hit a certain critical point where you start to now induce a transport channel in the out of plane direction, which did not exist. And that's what leads to an enhancement in your, both in your voltage by suppressing, you know, re recombination and also inducing better, uh, you know, charge collection, which is reflected in your fill factor. Okay. And so finally, you know, you end up with a device, which is about 18.3%, not quite still a 20% device, but uh, but still, uh, this gives us hope that this opens up a possibility of using uh, you know these types of effects, engineering these cations in such a way that you can actually get uh, uh, transport and really make a two D device work like a three D device without compromising its intrinsic uh, uh, stability to light and moisture. Okay, so uh, I think that with that, I will I will stop. Uh, uh, I think I've exceeded my time, and I will be very happy to take uh, questions. Well, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I'd like to op open the session up for, for questions then. Um, if anyone has questions to start for um, for Aditya, please go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask your question. I think there's a question from Hua. Let me see. Hey, Hua. Go ahead. Hey, how are you? Hey, good. Uh, how are you? So, yeah, th yeah. thanks. It's, it's very exciting talk. A, yeah, it's uh, well, it's a pity you don't have a time to talk about the UED work, which is also published yes. this year. So yes. anyway, maybe next chance. <laughs> yes. So I have a quick question for the 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 lie induced. <laughs> That's a very interesting result. So. So the well, from the XPS, you know, uh, result that's also in situ, right? XPS. It, it looks like from the title, the XPS. Yeah, yeah that's also. In situ. Yeah. So my question is, uh, so both lead and the iodine, they show this, uh, you know, uh, blue shifts that go to hide a binding energy. So, so your your interpretation is the iodine definitely have an oxidization. Yeah, that's pretty natural. But how about the lead itself? Is yeah, that lead also any change of balance? Because yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a great yeah. question. In fact, we wondered about this a lot. And I think what we think is uh, happening to the lead is that obviously the lead hosts the electrons, right? Uh, and so the electronic yeah. states are quite delocalized, right? And so the electron, I mean, the hole gets localized on the iodine, but the electron gets delocalized. And so what we think is happening is that the lead is. Uh, is uh, observing a secondary effect which comes from the iodide, right? Uh, and so that's why we see uh -huh. a shift also in the, you know, at, toward, towards a blue shift. 
uh, as opposed to say, you know, maybe even a redshift or something like that, which would be uh, corresponding to the electrons or, you know, being electrons localized on there. So we think this is some kind of a secondary effect which exists. Uh, and that's what's causing this, uh, uh, you know, shift in the lead as well. Okay. Okay. I see. So, so, and now, so uh, uh, the electron really dope to the iodine is really coming from the light, right? Light induced the yes. uh, yes, carrier absolutely. to the to the iodine, right? The oxidant. Yeah, okay. Yes, absolutely. I mean, so I didn't talk about it, okay. but the temperature uh, yeah. effect of this is that everything expands, right? So you put light on this and everything expands. Uh, um, and and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, unfortunately, I need to leave because um, I need to get to my babysitter. But thank you so much um, uh, for inviting me. And I leave you in the competent hands of Christopher. Uh, Christopher Garibe, he has carried out um, the uh, GIX PCS work. And he also knows about the rest of our group. So if there are questions for me, I'll pass on to Christopher. Well, terrific. Thank you so much, Eva. We appreciate your, your contributions to this, to this workshop. And we're glad that Christopher is, is here to Thank a continued you. discussion. Bye. Thank you. More questions for Aditya or for Christopher? Oh, Jen has a question. Jen? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a very uh, exciting work. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, uh, so how much of this uh, light induced uh, contraction is from, you know, uh, in homogeneity of of the uh, of the uh, 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 the material uh, the, the sample, I mean, so uh, so <coughs> more like a on the surface of you know you have a multiple interfaces and the surfaces and and so uh, so but for the uh, the physical surface of the sample, uh, what contribute more of this uh, you know effect or you know it's a more homogeneous. Uh, uh, throughout the you know these uh, yeah so we, we uh, think that this effect is uh, homogeneous uh, across the sample um, for multiple reasons uh, so we've done these measurements on powders uh, yeah. which are uh, which are of course you know which are you know which are which which are kind of almost trans so you basically have all the x rays kind of going through you can also get a signature from the substrate and the light actually penetrates through so you can actually measure the transmission from the light we've also performed these on single crystals which are you know the flakes are of the order of about 200 nanometers of thickness uh, and this also shows the effect uh, and then of course the solar cell films which are about uh, 200 nanometers right mm -hmm. and all of these things uh, seem to show the same effect uh, of uh, this light induced contraction. So we don't think that this is really inhomogeneous uh, because really what we are measuring is bulk properties in the device, right? Okay, yeah. so, okay, that's... And also in XPS, these are all fairly representative bulk measurements. Uh, and um, so we think that this is a homogeneous effect which comes from the structure of, uh, you know, of this 2D perovskite. Okay, so so in, in terms of the measurement, uh, you know, so you uh, looks like uh, you just uh, spread out the, all these, uh, uh, you know, powder on the surface, right? So if you sort of like collect all these powder, put in the, the capillary or something, you know, so yeah, uh, you would uh, have the same, you know, powder ring. Uh, Yes, uh, so so these were done with smeared on the substrate. So we didn't put it in the capillary, but we these were sort of smeared. Uh, on on uh, silicon or a glass, I, I can't remember one of these substrates. Okay. Hmm. So get, get, getting on the substrate uh, uh, like that, it just uh, you know uh, you probably will have a uh, you know a better illumination of X ray. Yeah, exactly. So because then you you can illuminate it homogeneously, and X rays we know that penetrate all throughout the, uh, you know, the substrate, right? Right. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe one quick question, a very nice talk again. Yeah, thank you. Um, do do um, 
do these things have, uh, I mean, some of the, the these perovskites act as x-ray detectors too. So do you have x-ray issues when you, you do your experiments? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. And I think there's a lot of work on x-ray uh, detection and things like this. Uh, we do check for beam damage every time we do these measurements uh, initially and just make sure that there is no uh, beam damage. So a uh, lo lot of times, uh, the first set of things to do is to look at what's the integration time, uh, you know, before we actually see beam damage and things like this. So at least in this regime, we don't see any effect of, uh, you know, X-ray based beam damage under these conditions. Okay. So, but, but uh, it could still have some form of light induced, you know, I guess, I guess you're getting more photoelectrons or you're getting right. a charge, but uh, yeah, it's, it's different. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, uh, you could I, I guess one would say that you could have some amount of uh, effects on this. Uh, they don't seem to be noticeable. Uh, I mean, typically when you start to get damage from the beam, you start to see it instantly in a structure. Um, at least we can't pick it up, right? But uh, I, I think you're right that there could be something which is something that is even um, you know something we are not sensitive to. Thank you. question actually on on that topic um chris christopher maybe you could tell us so in in your study i think you used the you used uh, uh dynamics that were induced by the beam so you purposely da damaged the sample so what what were you looking for and monitoring to um that you that you knew that you were so um, we were pretty sure about damaging our samples because we looked at the beginning at the two time correlation functions and tracked them against the um, yeah, dose of, of beam we had on it and then saw about after one second of full beam, we already got um, some induced dynamics, even spread one second of beam over 20 seconds or 10 seconds. Um, yeah, but in the end, in our study, we illuminated the sample around 60 seconds. So we were pretty sure that we had beam damage in that yeah, experiment. And that, that was all in the dynamics though, right? So in the, from a structural point of view? From the structural point of view. Structural point of view, did you pick up on anything? Um, we saw decay in overall intensity, but not in the position of features. Thank you. I see Jen has a question. Um, and Zhang, how about, so Jen, how about, how about Zhang? Because Jen, Jen asked a question, then we'll go back to, start with Zhang and go back to Jen. Okay, okay. so uh, yeah, this is a question or maybe comments for Eva or Christopher. So um, your work of like selecting, you know, particular is the angles to decouple the you know, the Q mixing, I think it's very useful. I mean, if you want to extract, uh, you know, correct, uh, you know, relaxation time or stretching or compression, like a uh, coefficients of the, you know, correlation functions. So my comment is, you know, you have shown there are four terms that are contributing or four origins contributing to the total scattering. I mean, the gradients and the geometry, and they contribute basically to like a uh, two channels that you mentioned that's like a GSAX or or GT sex channel, that reflecting channel or transmission channel. So uh, so that means that two of the four terms contributed to the transmission signal. The other two contributed to the reflection signal. And that means you only have two different Q, you know, separate two Q mappings, not like four Qs in there. So that means yeah. that, so what I want to say is, is, is going to higher incident angle, for example, 1.5 to two times the Korean angle, definitely going to separate these two channels. Um, that I completely agree, very useful. But the other part I don't really understand when Eva mentioned that in her slide that you have to analyze around the specular. That part I don't really get it because if you can separate these two, I mean, if you, as long as the incident angle is high, you can analyze, you know, there are only one Q mapping in the detector. So you can only, mm -hmm. you can analyze, you know, any part of the. Yeah, you know, that's that, that more. 
Yeah, good question. That is more about um, the distortion you will get due to refraction um, near the um, um, the, yeah, the, the, the critical angle. So if you are around the specular peak, um, the distortion um, in your delta QC, so the difference between your intrinsic and your detector QC becomes nearly linear. So you don't have that much different mixing um, in your region of interest. Because even when you then look at your region of interest and that's too big along QC, you will get different mixing at the beginning and at the end. So if you then, yeah, are at a higher QC, that will become linear um, and not, um, yeah, change that much. So that's more the idea behind that. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I have to understand this more because I believe you. If you go into high the angle, the mm -hmm. mixing sort of already decoupled. So this, so two of the reflection channels, they basically, I mean, they come from different origins, but they basically have the same Q mapping. Maybe I understood something wrong, but on my understanding is this. More like a shifted Q mapping, but, but that's also not completely oh, uh, linear okay. if you look at the intrinsic Q. So that's the point behind that. Um, there's a nice um, paper um, from Kevin Yeager on that. So if you're mm -hmm. interested. Okay. Is, it, is your paper published already? Um, it's in the last stretches of acceptance. Okay. Okay, I would like to see that. Thank you. And Jen had a question. Yeah, so uh, actually in the similar lines, uh, 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 the Sunny's uh, or, you know, uh, earlier question and uh, and the Jean's question. So uh, yeah, it, it is a, a nice to see, you know, uh, well, it's, uh, so you're you're so much into uh, you know separate all these uh, contributions from the uh, the, uh, the 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 multi beam uh, uh, terms. So uh, so I, I I just wonder so how uh, how rough are these uh, uh, films are you know so that the, so do you know uh, because it, you know Sonny asked a question about the transmission uh, uh, so. Uh, you know, a lot of a uh, you know, especially in the in the reflection channel. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's a uh, you know the uh, the surface roughness will have a you know more effect there. So, so we had about twenty nanometers of roughness for our films. So quite nanometers. a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. But so. the underlying substrates of silicon they had about like one nanometer, two nanometers. And we also included this roughness for the calculations of our fresnel coefficients. Okay, so okay, so uh, with that the data, you know, uh, the these roughness numbers they're from, uh, you know, fitting to the reflectivities or uh, no, other we means, extracted so... them from AFM measurements. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah, that would be interesting to see, you know, how how you know the roughness, uh, uh, you know, really affected the uh, the uh, uh, the reflections, you know. So mm -hmm. that you know, with that twenty nanometer, uh, the, you know. Yeah, we already had a pretty diffuse signal. Right. So that <laughs> so so whether you will get the really you know good, uh, you know the uh, definition of the. Well, it's not definition. It's just uh, you know the, the intensity can be the reflection uh, intensity can be really low, you know. So that uh, yeah, that was also the kind of or one of the reasons why we had to go to beam damage uh, to induce dynamics, and also have had like sixty to two minutes of full beam um, because we were missing, especially in the GT region of the detector, um, mm -hmm. just the necessary photons. Yeah, as uh, you know, I will be in very interested in uh, you know uh, reading the uh, you know uh, uh, your work because mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I think it uh, for these type of things is really hard to <laughs> just you know summarize the, with the one or two uh, uh, slides you know so that okay, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any more questions for Aditya or for Christopher? I have one question for Christopher. So when the XP, the dynamics measurements that you mentioned, what were the 
conditions like what were the photon flux and the spot size did you get the chance to play with those things to to try to reduce the flux density on the sample um we did try to play with it um in the beginning we tried to um, adjust the flux so that we don't have any beam damage get sufficient signal in the gt region and in the gi in parallel um but when changing the incidence angle we we didn't succeed um but in the end we had a flux of i don't want to lie i have to look it up uh of about five times 10 to the power of 11 photons per second. Wow, okay. Did you really need that many that many photons? Or could you have lived with 10 times less? So... Um, probably, um, yeah. but in the end, we wanted, as I mentioned, um, a good signal also in the GT region, and we just had a lot yeah. of absorbance in there. And yeah, so we really needed the full beam. So what was the uh, the photon energy there? Um, we worked at nine point six five kV. Okay, so so what a benefit from a uh, from a higher energy. Uh, so so you you get enough of contrast from. Uh... Um, I think if you go too high, you could be again at the absorption edge of lead, so you don't want to go too high um, or oh, then okay. even higher. Um, but we also were a little bit limited by the energies from CHX um, at NSLS2. Right, right, right. And so, yeah, I was thinking, you know, so in the future, you know, so that the weather. I think yeah. in the future, it could be really interesting, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, more discussion? I think we should uh, thank our speakers from this last session of our workshop and, and all the speakers for this workshop overall. So thank you all. Appreciate so much all, all the work that you brought to uh, tell us about. And I think we've um, had some very good discussions about uh, both from, from, a, from, a, um, from the theory side um, what we can do with GAXPCS and, and some exciting uh, experimental um, directions, uh, technology directions from uh, inorganic, organic, and, and hybrid materials in, for different um, applications. Um, I believe, so I've, we've been recording these and I believe they'll, there, there'll be a mechanism eventually where, where um, they'll be um, available. So I can, hope I can share that with you. You can um, share that with anybody else, um, but I'm not sure what, well, well, I'll find out from the user office how that's going to work. And so thank you everybody for your participation. Thanks also uh, again, um, Zhang and Jin, my co-organizers, and thank, thank everybody for your time um, participating. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, uh, really, it's a Joe, you know, put, putting a lot of effort and the time to, you know, to get all the speakers together and everything. So, uh, so uh, thank you, Joe. And a pleasure. Oh, and I would be remiss if I didn't remind everyone, mark your calendars for our uh, first experiments workshop, uh, August 8th and 9th. So <laughs> that's going to be coming up soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joe, as ever. Yeah, hope to see you soon. Thanks, Thanks for organizing it. Great workshop. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop recording and then quit the meeting. <laughs>